This episode is about minutes 51 through 55 of The Empire Strikes Back with returning guest Frank Lehman. Hello there, and welcome to Star Wars Music Minute, where we celebrate the music and sound of Star Wars five cinematic minutes at a time. I'm Chrysanthi Tan, but you can call me Xanthi, and today is all about minutes 51 through 55 of The Empire Strikes Back, which starts with Luke telling R2 to watch after the camp and ends with Luke asking how far away Yoda is. In, the, in between that, we also have Leia and Han's first kiss and our first Emperor Palpatine sighting. Um, there's a lot to talk about. I'm really excited to have, oh gosh, John Williams scholar, film musicologist, music theorist, Frank Lehman back on the show, who's already been referenced so many times that it's just, it's almost, it's almost a joke at this point. But you know what? I, I cherish uh, the time that I, that I have with you, Frank. Thank you so much for coming back on. Well, thank you for having me. Um, I wonder if it's okay for me to play my own drinking game every time <laughs> yes. I reference myself, I guess. I got to take a swig of coffee here. So I'll be pretty caffeinated by the end of this episode. <laughs> Excellent. I think. Um, you previously <laughs> said only water or a very sweet beverage counted. So I guess coffee can be added to the list of acceptable. Oh, yeah. So I think... Um, I definitely need the coffee on that list, and sweet alcoholic drinks are, are yes. okay. Yoo-hoo, and various <laughs> really unhealthy sodas. I think those are those are the acceptable uh, beverages. Great. We'll all have water for that. Um, <laughs> we have a lot to talk about, including. I mean, in the in these minutes, we have the first um, Han and Leia kiss, and we have a really um, a really nice. I don't know, instance of their theme. We also have some very weird music for, for the emperor, which is not the emperor's theme, like what we know later as the emperor's theme. It's something different. And in between that, we have some you, Luke and Yoda, you know, before Luke knows that Yoda is Yoda. So we also mm-hmm. have some very different Yoda music. Yeah, this is... Um... An exciting span of music from this film, although I have to admit that you could have picked any random five minute span from this and it would probably count as some of the greatest film music of all time. This is just a an impossibly great score. But I like this cue or the, this little span in particular, not just because of the introduction or the, the first real full statement of Han and Leia's theme, but because of that fascinating music for um, the Emperor's hologram, which does differ in a lot of really striking ways to the, well, the more thematically driven music that he's then associated with from Return of the Jedi onwards. This is sort of um, more in-process music and not as thematic, or not thematic at all, really. But there are some other interesting things to talk about as linkages to other cues and other topics in the Star Wars um, musical landscape. So maybe we can, we can get to that when the time comes. Yeah. Although before we get there, I'll say that maybe it, perhaps it shows restraint that in changing the emperor to um, Ian McDiarmid in I think two thousand four or or you know mm-hmm. one of those later editions, um, they could have perhaps changed the music as well too. I'm glad that they didn't, but. Um, but yeah it, yeah, it just goes I to agree. show that like it wasn't fully the emperor concept wasn't fully fledged out at this point yet. Yeah, I agree completely. I'm so glad that they left that scene musically unaltered. Actually, there's a tiny bit of a change. I think a, a few measures are looped because the mm. the post 2000 f- yeah, the the conversation, the dialogue just is a little bit longer than in the original 1980 version. Um but the the music is, you know, the notes are not shifted and there's no interpolation of the emperor's theme which is a relief you know uh, uh, it would have been uh, sacrificing some of the most interesting music from that movie the the series and also uh well i'll cut to the chase it it resembles or um prefigures music later in the the film in a really important way so if that had been in lost film. then you wouldn't get in this film yeah the the oh. music for Vader's conversation with the emperor is um, very closely related to the music that um, immediately precedes Vader's I am, or Luke, I am your father. Of course, he says, no, I am your father. But that you know, pivotal 
sequence has very similar music. Um, and you can sort of sense why they would be connected on this mostly orchestrational level because of the similar you know, subject matter of, of uh, Luke's secret parentage. So yeah, you, you'll lose that if you just toss in the Emperor's theme. Uh, this is, like you said, a, an example, a rare example of restraint um, <laughs> in terms of Link is, uh, Lucas's tinkering. I also remember, it doesn't I, this never usually came to go. anything. It, it no. doesn't, what'd you say? I, I, there, there was talk, I don't know if it was for the special editions in 97 or for the DVD release in 2004, but I remember hearing rumors that Williams was going to write new variations of uh, the Imperial March for A New Hope, because, of course, that movie does not right. uh, contain the Imperial March yet. But obviously that never happened, and I think that's that's okay, too. I, I mean, I he wasn't okay as... Too. <laughs> To find a character, and we would have been losing the you know the little imperial motif from A New Hope, which is nice yeah. in its way too. You know, I I what I played a little bit of the Star Wars Lego, I guess video game that came out. Um, mm-hmm. I'm not really sure what it's called. It was it was my friend's uh, system, but um, a, the A New Hope game uh, it doesn't have the Imperials motif. But it has the Imperial March, and I was like, what the hell? But the rest Come of it, on, you know, the rest of it has like all the stuff from. <laughs> you know, a new hope you play through it. And it's like, you're going through the movie except, except for the Imperial March being there. Well, I guess I kind of get it. The Imperial yeah, March it. is, is bigger than any one movie, of course. Yeah. It's a small quibble. Um, but yeah, the restraint <laughs> musically, I find that they're overall, the musical restraint is pretty good with glaring exceptions, like some of the diegetic music, especially um, usually gets, has usually gotten the 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 change the change up like Jedi rocks yeah well and mm, victory celebration yeah. I actually like well I actually like Jedi rocks and victory celebration because I grew up with them but but I can see how it, I can see how that change would be like pretty big yeah I, I'm I'm a big fan of victory celebration I will not defend Jedi rocks <laughs> though I have I want nothing to do with that sequence. <laughs> When you get to Return of the Jedi, you should like vindictively assign me those minutes if I'm still doing this. <laughs> like, find something oh, no. interesting to say about that. <laughs> oh my gosh. Um, yeah, when I get to Return of the Jedi season, I think I will have to like give weight to both versions. Yes. Just because yeah. they're both such a big, yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, anyway, okay. Um, let's, get, let's listen to the beginning of these minutes. The camp. So, where is R2 when I need him? That's it. I mean, that's all that's we have it. of the, you know, just the little mm-hmm. clip of Dagobah. And it's really just a simple, you know, and then an octave down. Yeah. Although it's kind of buried in the mix, but there's there's some string harmonizations on top of that very very faint. Um, I think it's a B flat augmented major seven chord. So this is audible. Let me know. Yeah. Which is a pretty characteristic chord type in The Empire Strikes Back. The sort of augmented hexatonic, mm. uh, you know, a combination of pitches, which is a, a whole bunch of different character. But motifs are related to Vader, but also the droids motifs. Um, do you know what? Yeah, and then under. Oh, sorry, do you know what? Ahead. Like set it is. Like fort number. Oh, well, <laughs> unfortunately, I do not have those all committed to memory. Um, <laughs> I guess it, it would be zero one uh, five eight. Okay, that's the zero, normal order, one, maybe. Uh, but okay, that'd be four. As far as it's okay. 420. Oh yeah, that makes sense. Um, wow. <laughs> yeah, I I should have memorized all of those. Oh no, names. I've Never. I just fully <laughs> looked that up on the set calculator. <laughs> oh, the set calculator. Well, the set calculator <laughs> is a godsend. Yes. Can you imagine a time before the set cal- PC no. set calculator? Well, yes, uh, in grad school, like oh, minus twelve. Wait, which is small? Uh, you know, we we do that. For one day, we figure out the conceptual sort of mathematical <laughs> rationale, and then it's like, you know it, you understand it intellectually, now make use of the technology. It's like, yeah. <laughs> you know, multiplying big numbers, we have calculators, why would we do it yeah. up by hand? Same thing with 
you know, set class determination. Yeah. Anyhow, yeah, so so there's that clarinet little um, uh, neighbor figure, and right afterwards when the scene cuts to the Millennium Falcon, it's also very faint, but I think it's the, the timpani that's doing a little... Totally. Little B-flat, F-sharp, yeah. or G-flat triplet back to... So, you know, evocative of the Imperial March, although probably not a... A, a real reference because it doesn't make sense in that particular context. But just a yeah, little tag it is, as it fades out. It is a little bit foreshadowing-y. It, and, and I will say before that, even there's, I think, is it harp or was it chill? I think it was harp. It was like... Yes, yes. Let's see. Unsettled. Uh, yeah. Let's, let's listen to that again. <laughs> There's the heart. Mm -hmm. And I, the strings underneath. Timpani. Oh, where is R2 when I need him? Sir, I don't know where your ship learned to communicate, but it has the most peculiar dialect. I believe, sir. And now there's going to be about 15 seconds with no music. I'm yeah. afraid we'll have to replace it. Well, of course. If I can say one more thing about that Please. cue, mm -hmm. there's actually a, a yanked out portion of it. Um, which you can hear on the, the soundtrack album, which features flutes and celeste or maybe vibes sort of moving in parallel, that you can see the, uh, um, the final version just removes those entirely. It's kind of uh, called R5P3 on the cue list, End Fix, which was orchestrated by Angela Morley. Often you see her come on towards the very end if there's like these very minor changes to the scoring. And I assume that the, the change version of the end of this little Yoda meets Luke and then onto the Millennium Falcon, that was a last minute shift. So, and it's basically just a removal of, of the parallel voice led flute stuff. But did it make an it? Interesting omission. You said it made it to the soundtrack? It did make it to the soundtrack. I can, if. Yeah, if you could play it, that would be great. Enable. Is it on Luke's Nocturnal Visitor? Yeah, it's on Luke. It's at the very end of Luke's Nocturnal Visitor. Okay. So I think, so I'll share my screen and. Okay. We're getting some audio looped through. <laughs> now let's... And this was, mm, mm. it didn't make it to any of the versions, right? It did not make it to any of the okay. versions. I'll play it again. It's, it's very brief. Hopefully it comes across the audio. Yeah. So very... something missing. Uh, interesting for a, another reason, which is the the harp underneath that uh, flute material is doing this sort of Yoda related motif. Oh, it's very it... subtle, which comes back later. Uh, yes. When, <laughs> well, first of all, it comes back actually in in Empire Strikes Back when he lifts the, the X wing, but then it really assumes status as a almost independent leitmotif in Return of the Jedi. Here, I think it's, it's textural, right? It's this sort of sl slight uh, accompanimental development of the contour of Yoda's theme. But just listen listen out for it. It comes okay. back Thank in you. a big way. We'll do. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, you um, never yes, know certainly. in the movie, though, because this is music that didn't make it into the final cut. But right, right. just one of the many hidden treasures in The Empire Strikes Back. Yeah. Wow. Okay. That's cool. Okay, so now we're in the Falcon, three POs, and where's R2 when I need him? And we have some, you know, the beginnings of Han and Leia. So Leia's, of course, just kind of just kind of standing there doing something on her own. And um let's let's hear what happens in case you didn't know. Well, of course I'll have to replace it. Here, I'm chewy. Uh, I think we better replace the negative power coupling. Here we go. Ah. 
Can we stop it there? Yes. <laughs> I know we're not going to make it very far before there's something really interesting to talk about. <laughs> but that's just a little instrumental, you know, introduction to the, the theme. Last, what, all four measures. And it's, uh, well, it's Lydian music, you know, which is a favorite of Williams and, of, and film composers in general. But I think in particular, like, there's a lot of different guises that the Lydian mode can take um, in film music. It's not just one blanket sort of scalar resource. And here in particular, it's this sort of descending figure in the first, the oboe, which is doing... Yep. So from the fifth down to the first scale degree. Yeah. Um, and and that, that's, that's a particularly like distinctive treatment of the Lydian mode of having the, the downwards motion, you would associate the sharpened fourth as a sort of leading tone to the fifth, and here it's actually part of a descending pattern. Um, and Williams loves this, and especially around this time, like the 80s, uh, if I can find a couple examples of very similar treatments of the Lydian mode as a sort of a source for descending, well, pentachords, basically, down from the fifth to the, the tonic. Um, so if it's all right, I, if I could play a few uh points yes. of comparison here. Yes, let's let me let's make sure that uh I want to make sure that I'm bringing <laughs> listeners along in case you needed anything clarified really quick. Um can you explain Lydian? Yes. <laughs> Sorry, I guess I was getting no, a little okay. ahead of myself there. Yeah, so um there are these things called the modes um in Western music, which is to say uh collections of seven notes that um, have a, a particular ordering, a particular series of steps or um, half steps that you can actually get without any accidentals. Uh, that's the important thing about the modes is they're all technically diatonic. They use the same basic structure as the major or natural minor scale, but they have their unique little properties. Um, and each one besides the major and minor scales um, has at least one distinguishing scale degree that sets it apart. So in the case of yeah. the Lydian mode, they all and have a scale degree of, is like is just the number, the pitch. That is the number. Oh yeah. gosh, how do yeah? So well, like you know, do re mi fa so la ti do. The, the, essentially, each one of those syllables is the same thing as a scale degree. Um, yeah. Scale degrees we just usually term in, uh, using numbers or functional names. Um, but in any case, so the, all these modes have these. I think more or less. Um, historically specious, ancient Greek-sounding names. Yeah. Um, and the Lydian one is the sort of more major than major scales, how I like to understand it. It features all the pitches that you would associate with the, the, the normal diatonic or Ionian mode. Plus... Except it's even more major. Mm-hmm. Instead of... There's... So it's so... Yeah. It sounds so very it, bright. So it raises the... The fourth note and brightness, exactly. I think that's the, the quality that's most often sort of associated with it. And film composers love it. I mean, it's associated with optimism and youth and childhood and benevolence and good feelings generally. Um, and it's present here uh, for the introductory paragraph to Han Solo and the Princesses, you know, that, that cue. And it's also a real hallmark of John Williams' 1980s style. So a few other examples here, not just of that scale in the abstract, but like with specifically this kind of descending pattern. And particularly once the flute enters in the Empire Strikes Back uh, iteration, it actually becomes basically diatonic at that point or regular major rather than Lydian mm -hmm. major. Um, but there's this kind of like chaining effect between it and the oboe where it will go down. In counterpoint with it, the, the oboe is sort of in very loose canon. Yes. So he, here's an example um, from E.T., which is another score full, like maybe the definingly Lydian <laughs> score <laughs> in the repertoire. And this is from the very end of it. Um, very different kind of affect because it's big and bold and triumphant, but has the same sort of descending Lydian quality for a lot of it. Oh, 
Oh, big time. All right. So in that case, it's actually for a dominant sonority. So I guess you could also read that as a Mixolydian um, scalar pattern. But the, the, the contour is pretty much the same. And mm -hmm. um, another example here, this is from Always, which is a, a rather less well-known score from 1989, Spielberg movie, sort of love slash ghost story, and full of Lydian harmony all over the place. I'll pull back a little bit further. Here we go. Stop it there. So that's from a track on the, the the new expanded album called Pete in Heaven. And he's literally in heaven. It's sort of a heavenly, <laughs> uh, cosmic, ambient, Lydian idyll. It's beautiful music. Um, and in the same, I think, effective family as, as this, as the introduction to Han and Leia's theme. Yeah, the those are, there's something else that, especially that first example was reminding me of, um, no, I, I can't, I can't remember, but it's, it, it is a very familiar, um, I don't know, this, it is, if it's very familiar, yeah. like for the end of a symphony or something, I don't know, it just. Uh, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm sure that there's, <laughs> it's familiar because it's well exploited, um, yes. and, and we, it's not quite as common in, in classical music, I have to say. It's more, I associate it more with film music and sort of a cinematic idiom. Hmm. Um, to the point where it's probably considered a, a cliche, maybe in the bad sense for modern, music. like contemporary film music. Yeah, I, I don't know that I hear it quite as often because it has such strong connotations and maybe was overused a little bit in the 1980s and 90s, you know, by composers like Williams and Horner and Goldsmith and everyone. So it's it's a little bit too, you know, naive and optimistic and ingenuous at this point to have a like a, a sincere application to film music. Would you slot it together with like the whole tone scale in terms of mm, cliche in film yeah. music? Yeah. Well, well, yes, I suppose I would. Um, I mean, the whole tone scale, oddly enough, is maybe a little bit more versatile, be, even though it has far fewer like <clears throat> tonal uh, ca capabilities. But <clears throat> uh, if you're thinking like whole tone harp glissandi is yeah. like introducing a dream scene, then that's that's a cliche that is, you know, <laughs> one can only use a um, very self-reflexive way these days. But yeah, I, I, maybe maybe this is to say whole tone harmony should have a revival. That would mm, be nice. Okay, yeah. Like we've uh, exhausted so many pictures resources. Let's start going back to good old well-trodden ones <laughs> um okay should i keep playing <clears throat> yeah yeah i guess i do also well i'm in a backtrack a little bit but i i do want to point out like i mean we've already discussed it but for people to listen to the the way that the flute hands off to sorry the oboe hands off to the flute and then um like frank said there's sort of a loose loose kind of canon which is you know, them playing one after another, sort of kind of the similar thing. Um, and then the French horn is going to take over the main melody. So oboe. Worship, I'm only trying to help. Would you please stop calling me that? Sure, Leia. Oh, you make it so difficult sometimes. I do, I really do. You could be a little nicer, though. Come on, admit it. Sometimes you think I'm all right. Occasionally, maybe. 
when you aren't acting like a scoundrel. Scoundrel? That C, C sharp minor, the cadence when she says yeah. scoundrel. <laughs> it's wonderful. Yeah, you know, I... I think about this scene sort of differently after having watched um, a video a few years ago, a video essay by Pop Culture Detective on YouTube. Oh. I don't know if you've seen this, but it's, I highly recommend it. Um, I can't exactly remember the name of the video. It's okay, but it's I'll about find it and I'll put it in the show notes. Yeah, it's characters played by Harrison Ford predominantly in the 1970s and 80s as Han Solo, Indiana Jones, um, and Deckard and Blade Runners having this sort of uh, um, coercive romance uh, angle where uh, this is sort of this older fashioned model masculinity which is kind of a, abusive and imposes itself on maybe kind of into it but maybe also kind of pulling back female heroines that you see in, in well definitely in this scene and in a lot of the in Indiana Jones um, scenes as well and it's it's probably not something that you would expect to see that, that much nowadays. I think we have maybe slightly more enlightened gender roles and representation in our, like, our big budget mainstream movies. But mm -hmm. it's definitely there, like this kind of coercive, romantic uh, aggressiveness from Harrison Ford. So are you so, saying... So putting that out there. So you're saying that you interpret the scene a little bit less charitably than you would have before? I mean, I I don't know that I interpret the scene on its own mm -hmm. negatively. I mean, it's it's a wonderful scene. It's well written and well acted and persuasive. You know, I, I think that there really <laughs> is chemistry between these two characters and it's realistic too. You know, uh, I, I think that she reacts the way that a real human would react and he's acting the way that a real human would act as well. But it's more the, the sort of trend in the way that these characters are written across multiple movies that is perhaps a little bit less savory. Um, yeah. mm -hmm. Agreed. You know, I never, um, I didn't like, I didn't, I didn't dislike, but I didn't particularly like Han Solo um, growing up. I always thought that he gave me the creeps mm -hmm. a little bit and um, it's only more recently that I'm actually interpreting the scene more chari not charitably. Like I always thought it was fine, but mm -hmm. sort of like, oh, okay, skip this part in my mind. <laughs> um, yeah. I actually like it more now as an adult, I think. Hmm. Maybe because I'm... Maybe because I'm comparing it to, I don't know, it, it could be so much worse, I feel. Um, sure. Not that, yeah. that's, not that that's like a good yardstick at all, but I think mm. maybe I'm more um, attuned to Carrie Fisher's or Leia's um, own desire as well. Yeah. Yeah. I think that actually that makes a lot of sense and seeing the force of her portrayal of that character and the amount of agency and yeah complexity you know i think justifies what in maybe another actor or pairs of a pair of actors hands could have been a much more uncomfortable scene here, yeah here it works i mean cuz no leia is such a a strong like independent leader of a character herself yeah exactly um, yeah okay so scoundrel Yes. So I wonder if you've ever thought about the influences or resemblances of this theme um, or love scenes in general and film music or otherwise there. I've heard it compared and I don't know that actually this is convincing to the theme from in the opening movement of Vi uh, Tchaikovsky's Violin Concerto or mm. one of the themes. Mm -hmm. uh, should I now crawling through my oops yeah that's it mm -hmm. yeah kind of, I've right? never really um, gotten that comparison I've never really liked mm -hmm. that compare or I've never really um, oh, I've never awesome. felt <laughs> that comparison personally as someone who has played the piece um, mm -hmm. it wouldn't it never even occurred to me until I heard someone else say it like maybe two years ago. 
And yeah. I think it was that infamous two set violin video where they're comparing like John Williams music <laughs> to um, other stuff. Some of like definitely com compelling comparisons, but um, the Tchaikovsky sure. violin concerto was not one of them for me. Neither is the opening of Korngold's King's Row, by the way. But um, nice. <laughs> yeah, it goes to a different place. So maybe I'll, mm -hmm. I'll, find, I'll find an example. Um, but basically, Tchaikovsky's violin concerto in D major, well, he only has one violin concerto, but it starts with the same major six, which is often talked about in Star Wars music, in like the crash course to Star Wars music and love themes is the major sixth. Um, mm -hmm. And it's this, you know, one, two, three, four, five, six. And that's how Leia starts, right? It's how Luke and, Luke, Luke and sorry, Leia and Han starts. <laughs> it's how Marion's theme starts, etc. cetera. Um, mm -hmm. And that's how the Tchaikovsky Violin Concerto starts. However, let's listen to how different of a place the Tchaik goes, in my, in my opinion. <laughs> okay, this is an Itzhak Perlman performance. Looks like a pretty old video. Okay, let's skip the, the clapping. Okay. I love Itzhak Perlman. Okay, this isn't the solo part. It's just the. Actually, it's a pretty. I think it has it's a, a fairly a pretty long. extended. Yeah, I was gonna say it's a yeah. fairly long intro, so <laughs> let's skip a little bit. <laughs> okay, it's still going. Up. Yeah, the solo has to just stand on stage for quite some time. Climb up there. Yeah. We're so close. Here we go. Here we go. The thing with that is it it doesn't go to a very harmonically complicated place, especially not as no. immediately as like Han and Leia's theme, which immediately goes to a very uncertain place. Mm -hmm. What do you think? Yeah, I, I agree completely. I mean, I think if you're just listening to the first four notes, yeah, then sure. And, you know, who knows? Maybe it was a source of inspiration, but it, it's no way is it a really deep or profound connection. I think there are other pieces that are, have much more in common with sort of the, the, the substructure of Han and Leia than the Tchaikovsky violin concerto, including other pieces by Tchaikovsky, in fact. Um, and yeah, in terms of harmony, I mean, this is, it does sound to me quite Russian, but Russian in the sort of exotic uh, mm. mode which makes use of a lot of mode mixture, which is a defining feature of this theme and some of uh, William's other love themes. So, like to, to give you context here. Right, that's part of the progression there. The first two chords goes from D flat major to E flat half diminished over D flat. And that already is a, a use of some chromaticism, chromaticism, some uh, pitches from outside of the, the main key signature of D-flat. If it had just been, I'll try this like a hypothetical version that doesn't use the chromaticism, let's see. Right. Right, which sounds much more vanilla and blasé than William's actual composition there. Yeah, and the, Tchaik the Tchaikovsky had was more... <laughs> of the vanilla variety, harmonically. Yeah, which is not to say it's not wonderful and 
the, what places that movement goes subsequently are extremely yeah. complex. No, I think it's a the great concerto, is, but the theme, oh, yeah, exactly. Yeah, fantastic. Yeah, but I think if you're going to make a comparison, actually, another really well-known piece by Tchaikovsky would be Romeo and Juliet, um, which serves as a, a sort of nexus for a lot of sort of amorous love themes in the 19th century, which are much, much more like pervasively chromatic. And mm -hmm. I think I would pair that with, you know, some of the, well, uh, like Russian slow movement themes from instrumental music, like uh, Tchaikovsky symphonies or Borodin, Balak Gurev, mm. Ripsy Korsakov, which often feature really long sustained pedal points on the tonic. So that's another aspect of this theme, which I think um, is characteristic and maybe sets it apart from some other Williams themes like Marion or Leia's, which, as we know, was initially thought of as Leia and Luke's love theme um, <laughs> and was written as a kind of amorous love theme. But Han Solo and the princess, or I like to call it Han and Leia, right? Why, why have them given different names in the name of the, the theme? Yeah. Like very frequently, <laughs> there is this low, stable, tonic pitch that undergirds four or even eight measures of its duration. So instead of it's with the stable bass note. Which provides a chance for some interesting dissonances, particularly when the third chord comes up in the sequence, which is D major. half step above the tonic in that case, which is even more like systematically chromatic than the previous chord and doesn't mm -hmm. belong to just a simple mode mixture out of the minor. It actually is suggestive of the Phrygian or some kind of more thoroughly chromatic kind of infusion of all 12 notes into the scale. It's not like it doesn't disrupt a sense of key or even really majorness per se, but it is quite characteristic um, and offers that really nice like it's not just there harmonically it's featured in the melody to the B, D, D natural and among the other things I yeah, know so I'm going just, on here the pedal is the C sharp that you're just holding on to yeah right and you get this nice little diminished third too melodic diminished third So it sounds like if it's played just those three notes in close proximity, it sounds like a dissonant cluster, but they're actually three different scale degrees. Like there's the seventh, mm -hmm. the tonic, and the second all nestled in there, which is why it's a diminished third. And that's motivic in, in Empire Strikes Back. This is not the only place that you get it. It's yeah, do, particularly... Do, 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 do. Exactly. So he plays with it uh, in, in the sort of the later cues, like the carbon freeze and... Totally. Um, Losing the hand, losing a hand, hyperspace is all over the place. It sort of detaches from Han Solo's and Han, Han and Leia's theme and becomes this sort of free floating motific particle, which I think is so cool. Yeah, that is really cool. That's a good connection. Um, yeah, now I'm going to be listening for even more of that. <laughs> um. I mean, this score is so dense with these things. It's, there's nothing quite like it in, in Williams' output. Um, can we listen to two other love themes? Um, Absolutely, as a, the ones that you a point me? of comparison. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, so again, I don't think that Tchaikovsky was necessarily on the forefront of William's mind in writing this theme. Um, and in fact, I don't know that there's anything that sounds exactly as uh, like a like a precursor or a model. But two themes by Miklos Rosa for the film El Cid, which was 1961, sort of uh, a massive historical epic, and then Cacheturian's ballet for Spartacus. The both feature, probably, they probably influenced each other. Uh, Spartacus influenced El Cid. Um, are these long adagios with really long pedal points and exotic sort of modally mixed harmony and a lot of flat seconds and mm. half diminished two chords. And the, the affect is there too. It's like this building of passion and tension and volume to a big... You know, romantic climax. I think both of these themes are very much in the same sort of manner as Han Solo and the princess. Excellent. Which one should we listen to first? I guess the Spartacus, Does since that chronologically came first. Yeah. yeah. All right. 
Here we go. keeps doing half steps where I'm not expecting. Mm -hmm. Wow. It's about to go off somewhere else now. Whoa. Cool, huh? That's and throughout really cool. that whole passage, just a, it's a stable D flat or C sharp pedal point. Like it never budges. It creates this, you know, uh, um, like the, the floor beneath the orchestra's feet where mm -hmm. it justifies the kind of increasingly dissonant and maybe not non-tonal, but outside of the, the strict confines of D flat major sort of harmony. You can get a lot, of, you can get a lot away with a lot if you have a pedal point sort of anchoring the music. Yeah, I always feel like the pedal point is like um, like a person just kind of standing in place, and then I feel like the camera is like moving all around them, and I like there's like a string holding, I don't know, like I feel... Yeah. Um, I mean, it also reminds me of like in Solo, when like L3, it, when Lando is coming to... Tar is like having to walk away from L3 when she has died, mm -hmm. or is, you know been injured um and the pedal point there is like his heart is with l3 and he keeps having to walk away close mm -hmm. he has to keep walking away but like the pedal point is still there oh, and i, I, I feel it. Yeah. like yeah it, it's with such love a, themes. Uh, an underappreciated but completely ubiquitous sort of bit of musical rhetoric uh, you know yeah. all through the 19th century people just like outdoing themselves in the 19th century in terms of like the length and complexity of the stuff that go, happens on top of a, a pedal point um yeah yeah and that's true in film music too it's, and I, I i don't see it really frequently discussed as a a nice part of the film composer's toolkit but it is extremely yeah. effective and quite easy to to achieve i feel like it very much is a very, I feel like it is an overt part of the film composer's toolkit. I feel like it is actually talked oh, okay. about a lot. <laughs> well, in that case, <laughs> just let's get some more pedal points. <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay. So now this in, is the love scene from El Cid. Definitely pick some violin forward music today. Yeah. You know, this is reminding me of uh, Defia. Yes. Big time. Big time, yeah. This has the texture of like a violin concerto. <laughs> the soul, there's a solo violin. That's not it's gorgeous, often heard. Yeah. Is that no. how it is in the film too? I think so. Yeah, it's been a while since I've seen it, but there's this huh. long extended love sequence in it. Wow. Wow. Yes. Um, so again, I don't think like on a strictly melodic basis, I don't hear that much in common, but in terms of 
the harmonic choices and some of the textures and just the overall sensibility, this strikes me as being in the same lineage or Han Solo and the Princess being in the same lineage as these kinds of pieces. Mm, definitely. Sort of Russian slash Spanish. You know, uh, Mikolas Rosa, I think he claimed to have done some research actually for the score to El Cid using historical uh, medieval Spanish um, Iberian Peninsula sources. I don't know okay. if that is reflected at all in, in the, <laughs> the cue that we just listened to. It's also possible he was just going for the sort of generic defia kind of Spanish classical sound, but it's effective right. for sure. Right. I was going to say he definitely captured it in the way that classical composers have quote unquote captured it. Right. Um, <laughs> right. Yeah. Well, thank you for those examples. Um, should we go now, back to none of them actually? Oh, yeah, no, no, no. Please we continue. Can... Well, None if we could just actually... hear like the the first the first paragraph of the the love theme from Empire again, because it it doesn't hold fast uh, tonally in the way that those other examples we just did. Mm. Do. Okay, I'm gonna play from the soundtrack. such a that cadence yeah it's very ambiguous um it is yeah as we get to the second phrase it 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 has a melancholy to it which all good love themes i think should Mm. um so a feeling of yearning or desire um and as it as it proceeds it becomes more and more functionally ambiguous so like we start out pretty clearly in d flat it's a you know, a modally enriched D-flat, but D-flat all the same. But by the end of it, I'm not really sure what key we're in anymore. So. Right, this this chord here, technically it's, you know, on the, what do you call it, C-sharp or D-flat, is still a form of the tonic triad, formerly the tonic triad in inversion, but I don't think that this really sounds like a stable or even necessarily the, the same... Um, point of reference as the opening key. And it's because of this sort of transference from mm. right, it doesn't actually cadence. It's just deposits right. you on an, That's true. a minor inverted via a pair of chromatic um, chords. So yeah, it, it goes astray. It can go even further astray in certain other variations though. Like there's the the alternate ending for this phrase is. See, but right, the second one, on, the, yeah. the, the one you just played for me feels mm-hmm. more forward moving. Yeah, well, it ends on a root position F minor triad, or maybe E sharp minor. We get into all kinds of enharmonic confusion with music that's as sort of thoroughgoingly chromatic as this. Um, Whatever the case, it's like a completely chromatic relationship with the tonic. Um, It's a tritone relationship between B minor 7 and F minor. That's not actually the progression that's used in in this particular cue, but there are other instances, including the concert arrangement and and the um, end credits suite that make use of that sort of darker, more propulsive kind of, I don't mm. know if you call it a half cadence or just a an open-ended way to, to uh, close off the first phrase of the theme. So very interesting, quite unlike like Leia's theme, which just ends in a super strong half cadence or Luke and Leia, which always does the same thing. Um, this is, it's yeah, certainly it's, the most it's, uh, it's, complicated emotionally. Yeah. Complicated and, and up in the air. Yeah. Mm-hmm. 
And things continue to be complicated in the B phrase, so. Yeah. Should I just keep playing where I stopped? Sure. <laughs> and of course that's when you see 3PO. Yeah. Yeah. So so that covered um both the B section and then the second A section of the theme. The B section is the part that goes uh, uh well actually how does it go? So that does end with a half cadence, but it kind of needs to give that very strong sense of tonal direction because mm -hmm. what precedes that is very uh, sort of fluctuating tonally. Um, it, it's either in like no key or maybe in the key of the Neapolitan. It's fuzzy and, and strange. Um, and also the, the subject that Williams did the most reworking for the second concert arrangement, which has basically this entirely different B theme. Yes. Well, I think we'll play that afterward. In time. Okay, cool. Yeah. The, um, so, yeah. When you say the direction, okay, do you mean the dee dee dee? Do you mean that's the more functionally direct, you know, that, that has mm -hmm. more of a functional direction after that? Yeah, like we're, we're, we're plopping down on... It concludes ultimately on a like A flat seven chord or G sharp seven. Again, who knows what the unharmonic, uh, right. correct and harmonic interpretation is here. Um, but that's the first like truly functional chord in a while that you can assign like a an obvious a Roman, Roman numeral, numeral to it. Mm -hmm. e yeah, but even there, like it's it's not a completely straightforward dominant. It's got like this. Actually, basically a polychord. It has the, mm. It's a dominant pedal point and then the Neapolitan on top of it. But it does include that diminished third, which is, at this point in the theme, kind of becomes a um, like a, a reference point in its own way to, to clarify the, the tonal structure. Right, and then it's back into the theme. Oh, nice. <laughs> oh, <laughs> yes. Just a little, little note yes. uh, about enharmonic. It just means, you know. I wish sure. I could have that in like teaching, just little captions that appear underneath my, uh, <laughs> my face whenever I say a term without defining it properly. You need an assistant to, to do that for you yeah. while you teach. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So, so basically, <sighs> like an E sharp could be the same, could be, is enharmonically equivalent to an F or, you know, an A flat is enharmonically equivalent mm -hmm. to a G sharp, but you would spell it in different ways depending on the context that you're in. And mm -hmm. particularly, you wouldn't really want to repeat, like, uh, you wouldn't want to have a G natural and a G sharp in the same scale, I guess, or, or, or whatnot. Yeah. 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 I mean, it's, there are different reasons that enharmonicism arises. I mean, some are perfectly, like, clear once you understand the principle of different key signatures. You know, some keys just require something like an, E sharp rather than F natural, mm -hmm. um, but in heavily chromatic music where uh, you know functions are are drawn from across different forms of a scale or different keys, um, and where progressions maybe are using uh, the same interval multiple times, like major thirds in succession, you, you tend to start piling up and harmonicism, like different and harmonic implications of the same pitch to the point where maybe those functions are lost. Um, mm. It's one of the reasons uh, that that this kind of music, this heavily chromatic but still triadic music, is notoriously difficult to analyze from like a Roman numeral perspective and it had led to various other methodologies for understanding it, um, yes. including neo-Romanian theory, which I've <laughs> had stuff to say about in the past. But this is not like... This is not the cue that like immediately screams out neo Romanian theory. It's actually a little bit more com complicated because there are also <laughs> possible Roman numeral interpretations for some of these, mm. like twos and 
fives and flat twos and flat twos of two and things like that. But it's very layered and complex. Yeah, well, I guess different tools are, it's good to have different tools for different situations. Right. Yeah, and there's no reason you need to restrict yourself to just one yeah. method. Um, yeah. Where were we? <laughs> I, so the theme was resuming. The theme um, was just and resuming. Cert- yes. Yeah, and, and things are getting more heated and intense, and it strains towards a cadence and does not reach it, right? It no. goes. Instead, there uh, is. Um... <laughs> Right, sort of yeah. quivers on that chord and then just is interrupted. Everything goes quiet. You get a pizzicato little figure for C-3PO's barging in. And the theme doesn't reach completion, right? Yes. Um, <laughs> the way that the theme before the, before the de-escalation, when C-3PO walks in, which is sort of a comical, pizz, you know, descending pizzicato, the mm-hmm. the orchestration of of the theme it kind of starts to it, it kind of develops in a in a very classic way um particularly okay well the horn is is taking the the main texture or sorry the main melody to replace it let's see let's get more and i'll kind of talk through it a little bit Hey, you're worshiping. So, I'm only f- trying to help. To start, it's just the French horn. Calling me that? Sure, Leia. The strings are kind of doing so these pads. Sometimes. I do, I really do. You could be Some a little harp arpeggios. Come on, admit it. Sometimes you think I'm all right. And then that's da ba 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 rocking figure in the cellos. Occasionally, yes. Mm-hmm. Maybe. When you aren't acting like a scoundrel. Scoundrel? Flute's taking over. Scoundrel. Flute and oboe. See like where the sound of that. No more French horn. Stop what? Stop that. My hands are dirty. My hands are dirty too. What are you afraid of? That part where there's like the rollentando, which you know, the slowdown, I feel like um it's like throwing down the gauntlet almost. It's like <laughs> a little pause where she's like, My hands are dirty. Are we gonna continue this? And then of course <laughs> we do hear it continue. Um my hands are dirty. My hands are dirty too. What are you afraid of? Afraid? You're trembling. And then it's subtle, but even though we're still doing woodwinds, more instruments are being added. You like me because I'm a scoundrel. And the violins are kind of. You're not enough scoundrel in your life. They're doing this very, the, this simple oscillating. Which is a very, which is, you know, common texture. Yoda's and I think that's, that's uh, in common with Leia's theme, too. Yes, Leia's theme. Um, just the strings are outlining, you know, chords. And notice one thing that's always worth noticing here, with big themes, Williams, he often likes to sort of uh, 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 hold back on a low bass note until uh, a beat or two after the onset of the, the theme. I think that's yeah. the case with, is with both instances of the the uh, uh, the A section of the theme here it's like yum ba, boom ba, da, yeah. da, 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 right sort You're of saving so right. that um, that the, the the ground to make things feel a little bit more I don't know floating gliding it's a it's a nice effect and and one that Williams is particularly fond of in his score yeah that's a good point definitely happens here okay Let's see. Let's hear that again. Okay. So now this is the part where the... Okay. So now flute, oboe, English horn, and horn. See that bass, the the chel... uh, the bass, the bass um, mm-hmm. pedal tone, I guess, the bass note, tonic, whatever, the root, root, that's what it's called, um, is happening on the beat three, not on beat one of each mm-hmm. measure. 
harp is doing some flourishes. And now. <laughs> Do, do, uh, do, yes. do. <laughs> yeah. So this is it is in a I think a small but um, proud lineage of musical love scenes that are interrupted. Mm -hmm. The most famous and probably the point of reference for all music afterwards is Tristan and Isolde, the gigantic <laughs> build up that lasts you know thirty forty five minutes in Act Two of the the uh, opera, and ends in the most catastrophic way when like the king barges in on the two lovers and they are about to, you know, have their orgiastic kind of um, mm -hmm. uh, communion on a, on top of a, another like really long held pedal dissonant throbbing chord. And then it doesn't resolve at all. And you kind of have to wait until the very end of the opera for that, that same right. basic musical sequence to, to, to reach completion. This is a little bit smaller scale, but it's not that different, like in philosophy, and has another echo or rhyme, I guess George Lucas would call in Attack of the Clones, of course. So that's where we mm -hmm. have another kiss between two characters that have been circling around each other a little bit, and that is also interrupted, not in that case by a droid, but just, I think it's Padme that pulls back from Anakin mm -hmm. after their first kiss on the... Um, the, the veranda or balcony on the Naboo, Naboo Palace. And Williams does something very similar, which is he gives the most full thus far statement of their love theme across the stars and does not allow it to cadence to come to a the sort of conclusion that's suggested by the gradual amplification of volume and instrumentation and whatever. So I have that as a clip if I want, if it's uh, okay to share. Is it found on the soundtrack? It is not on the soundtrack. Mm, it's um, not. Yeah, and unlike the uh, Empire Strikes Back scene, which I think most people are very fond of and think is a successful one, this <laughs> I think is in in keeping with the overall sort of cringy nature of their relationship more laughable, perhaps. <laughs> It's hmm. it's not quite as well pulled off musically. It's very adroit, but maybe also a little bit on the nose. But let's let's I'll pull it up. The first kiss. So. so there's a bit in the way of sound effects here. I hope that's audible. It is. Okay. Do you know the timestamp in the movie? It's kind of like cutting out a little bit. Oh, um. Uh, okay. About to play. Oh my god. <laughs> Here in combination of the 20th Century Fox fanfare and Atrocity. <laughs> yeah. So combination this is this no not needed. audible here? <laughs> no, <laughs> well, it, I'll, it, I'll play the No, it it's audible. It was just being weird for a second, like kind of cutting out. Uh, well, hopefully this will work. Um here's the here's the theme. Uh, it starts on oboe. Okay. It's a very sudden cutoff. It is. So it gets even less deep into the theme before it gets interrupted, right? There's only one or two measures worth of like real full string orchestration and just everything shoots down. Um, the music literally like pulls away from the third and fourth measure of that stage in the theme. It's essentially doing um, the same thing, but in a earlier part of the thematic structure than in Hansel and the Princess, like sort of suggesting a climax and then not achieving it. Yeah. Okay, wait. I'm going to... Because the audio is kind of weird, I'm going to... I think I found... Here we go. Yeah, but now we have to hear the, the dialogue. <laughs> I... I think I'm a, a rare defender of their relationship. 
Okay, he's looking at her very piercingly here. No, she, she's looking at him. He's leaning in. And they're kissing. No. I shouldn't have. Yeah, I feel like this one is more awkward, actually, musically, mm -hmm. than the Han and Leo one. Yes. It's definitely more awkward. I think it's designedly so, right? Uh, I think it's the decrescendo <laughs> that's baked into it that does it for me. It's the decrescendo and that little micro pause, the fact that it happens really in the middle of the phrase rather than in Han Solo and the Princess. I think it's like a four measure unit. So it hits that big uh, uh, sort of D major over. Like that's where you would expect the theme to have ended. So like at least the thought is kind of completed in terms of the hypermetrical structure. In Attack of the Clones, it's like, not only is it, you know, an abrupt change in terms of orchestration and thematic content, but it's also, like, really disruptive of the hypermeter. So there are musical reasons for its awkwardness. And Yeah, yeah it I, feels I, more self-aware in Attack of the Clones. It's, it's like, very okay, we're going to do a joke here. Like, it feels more like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's drawing a lot of attention to itself. It's a very over-the-top it, it sort of theatrical, um, stagey kind of... Like you can hear the screech of the breaks. Yeah, like a, a record screech. Like, what? Um, which also, it kind of... It, it fits in a way with their very stilted and sort of archaic relationship, too. And it's all Perhaps. heightened and, and not necessarily realistic. So. I felt this way about when L3 interrupts Kira and Han. In solo as well. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Where yeah, I, I so, feel like that so. was done very awkwardly too. And also, well, thanks to the deluxe version of the solo soundtrack, we know that the cue was written out, was written out more fully, and then mm -hmm. I don't know, stopped <laughs> prematurely in the film. I don't know that there's any comparable sort of uh, forwarded kisses or things of that nature in the sequel trilogy. Uh, well. Uh, well, well, in so, the Rise of Skywalker. Uh, well, thwarted is it thwarted or it's not like thwarted? <laughs> ben Solo just randomly dies and transubstantiates. Yeah, I guess, but that would be the the place to look. That and maybe the Finn and Rose kiss. Oh, true. Towards in, the end of Last, Last Jedi, Jedi. Mm. right? But that listeners, those are not, let us know if there's any thwarted other yeah. thwarted kisses in Star Wars that we. I mean, there are thwarted kisses between like Poe and Finn that true. are purely, you know. <laughs> In the imagination of fans. Well, those are big time thwar thwarted. I don't know. <laughs> they, they really yeah. thwarted them. <laughs> they went out of their way. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Uh, so it's a it's a great, I mean, this is, what happens here is almost like a promise for a future more full and resolved um, appearance of the theme. It's like we're, it's, it's, it's shrewd. It's very clever compositionally to give us this, what seems like it's going to be like a very, um, summational climactic statement of their love theme, but it doesn't quite arrive at that that fullness or apotheosis. But later in the score, you do get it. Like it happens in Carbon Freeze, and especially towards the end of the movie, like the very last thing that happens before we go to the end credits is you know a full, fully realized. Um, I wouldn't from say start it's to fully... finish version. Okay, so this is where the concert arrangement, oh. I guess, discussion oh, yeah. might come in. Mm -hmm. Where I don't, I feel like the Han and Leia theme is more fully realized later on in the film. Of course, I don't know if I would call it. It would. I would still very much say that it's extremely complicated, though, like full of questions. Yeah. Even though, it, yeah, I you suppose know, it, that's true. It could still very definitely. It takes a dark turn. Like it, it gets it goes mm. to even more beautiful, big romantic places, and there's also so much terror baked into it in a yeah. way like, well it's certainly true for for the carbon freeze sequence and then also the escape from bespin both like when they're shooting out at um boba fett's ship and then when they actually escape the, the planet there are big very um heavily developed versions of han solo and princess leia's love theme there but you're right that they they have the sort of undercurrent of anxiety danger. and the danger, yeah, you know, both rhythmically and also in terms of the harmony. I don't know. I think the 
the very last statement, right, you know, during the rebel feat is pretty much as stable as we're going to get. Of course, it also mm -hmm. then transitions to the end credits, which themselves host a really, you know, you know nicely um, straightforwardly structured version that, that ends as blazingly major as you can. Um, and yeah, and then there are the concert arrangements, plural, you know, at least three yeah, in three, a certain way, yeah. um, which are radically, radically different from one another. And I mean, famously, I don't know how famous this actually is, but among people who like obsessively go over every word that John Williams ever spoke, he forgot that he had written a love theme because when episode two came out, he and George Lucas are like, talking on the DVD commentary about how this is the first ever love theme in a Star Wars movie when, hey, you know, you had Han Solo and Princess Leia and also kind of Leia and Luke in two different ways. Um, but regardless of whether he really remembered or that was just a joke, like he did write a concert arrangement for the original film. And then he wrote another one in 2018 um, after, I think it's 2018. It was after yeah. Force Awakens, maybe after Last, Last Jedi. I think it was um, after Last Jedi. Yeah, which would have meant that it was after, after Carrie, Fisher Carrie Fisher's death. Yeah, which may partially explain why it has much more of a sort of somber, bittersweet tone than the and then the already fairly dark, you know, comparatively dark theme in its original format. And then he further elaborated it and changed things around the the violin and orchestra version for Anna Sophie Mütter. So you get to really see his evolution a thought towards this relationship and there, there are whole sections that are unique to the new version that are nowhere present in the old version. It's really fascinating. I, um, even in the very first concert arrangement, which I don't, did he ever even record? I don't think he ever recorded it himself. He didn't record. There's a, um, a recording on Vera's Sarah band. Yeah. It's a very, that, that features it. Yeah. I, but that, that is him. Yeah. That, that's his arrangement. It's his arrangement, but he's just not conducting. Mm-hmm. Um, He's just not conducting it. Yeah, so I'm going to play a little bit from the 2018 version, which, a court, which, well, let's. I'm going to just a kind of random place in it. Rhythmic change is interesting. I feel like it's not going to the same complicated place. And now this that portion is just taken from the Rebel Fleet, but everything else mm. before that hand before yeah. hand is so this, this is, is the only place where you hear that that's the original B theme, the only place in the concert arrangement from twenty eighteen that it occurs. Oh. Yeah. Everywhere else he has this new B theme. In oh, fact, 
if um, if you would permit me to share my screen, Absolutely. I can show something that I have been working on here. Oh, exciting. Oh, I, um, share. All right, is this visible here? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I have been hard at work um, making little improvements to my thematic catalog, and the, the section that I thought warranted the most um, elaboration, honestly, was the portion on the light motifs themselves. Oddly, it felt like the incidental motifs and set piece themes, I gave a lot more attention than the much more, you know, salient uh, main light motif. So now every light motif has at least a a little paragraph written for it, or they will, mm -hmm. most of these. So you can oh, sort nice. of see are sketchy, but I'll get there. And the musical examples are going to be bigger, and there'll be you know, more wow. detail and alternative forms and things. So this is taking a lot. It's going to double the size of this already gigantic catalog, <laughs> I hate to say. So, so ah. it's it's not really like a simple reference source anymore. But I've also made some, I think, quality of life improvements. So, like one thing, the uh, each section will s start with just like a themes at a glance section, where you get just the incipits. They're all in C major or C minor, and then if that's not enough for you, then you can start seeing like the the really fleshed out stuff here. But anyhow, on the topic of oh God, you can see all the stuff that I did for the Imperial March. There's so much. Oh to wow! It. Good grief! Yeah. Um, this is going to change the numbering system slightly, which I okay. hopefully won't impact y your work too much. Um, but I've demoted the uh, notes. <laughs> yeah. Um, so far, I think it's pretty much the same, though. But for Han and Leia, in what way does the so, numbering system change? Is it because you're um, including, like, I'm assuming more numbers will be added mm -hmm. because you're, yeah, okay. Oh no, no, in no. fact, uh, I think I think we're going to be. I'm shaving off a light motif. I I've oh. demoted. Apologies to the Ewok fanatics. I've demoted the horn call from an autonomous theme to a sort of supplementary aspect of the main Ewok theme. Mm. Uh, um, sorry to say it, um, <laughs> but so that means one fewer light motifs. But there, there, there are a lot of other changes. Um, like the Boba Fett thing, I start to fold in some of like stuff that I had called trouble on Bespin mm -hmm. down here. You, you haven't gotten to Boba Fett in in not yet. Star Wars Music Minute yet, so this is irrelevant at this point. But oh, I'm like... Not in Leia, so... Oh, okay, hi Leia, <laughs> I see. So, um, the first sort of text block here just includes the main theme with uh, some of the text that I had originally just shoved under a footnote somewhere. And I've used this second space to describe the B theme or the B section, which is in the original form... And then there's a second form, which is totally new to the revised concert arrangement, which is. Sorry, I'm playing this with one hand while <laughs> manipulating the computer on the other. Um, and you can see, like, although there are some similarities in, in the contour and uh, the harmonic uh, vocabulary is actually fairly different. Like, there's not much in the way of shared chords here. and they, it, it almost seems as though Williams wanted a second shot at composing a B section for this theme. Mm -hmm. One that I think actually even more strongly resembles some of that, like, Cacciaturian, Miklos Rosa stuff. It's, it's more wistful, it's a little bit more, uh, less chromatic, which may be, you know, you mentioned it felt a little bit less complicated or complex, but at the yeah. same time, you know, there's an austerity to it, maybe a maturity, less artifice. I think that's true for the the concert concert arrangement as a whole. That it's a little bit less youthful. Well, it's, it's less you know, emotionally volatile. Yes, much less emotionally volatile. It's it's much more sort of grounded and uh, un unperturbable. So yeah, that's that's one thing that will be now foregrounded in <laughs> this new version of the catalog, which. Could be months away or days away. It really depends on... I do this in my <laughs> free time. So if I have a big window coming up, I'll try to get as much done as possible. I can also share some other things that have been... Interesting. I see. Compare in con I'm like looking at I'm like, compare contour with Kylo A. Redeemed. 
Mm. Oh, yeah. Mm, okay. <laughs> Some of these are also just notes to myself, like gotcha, fixed gotcha. chord symbol number two in form one. This is simply not correct. It's not an A sharp chord. It's an A chord with a sharp four. Um. Actually, some of the inspiration for this was a field guide. Like, I like the idea of having notable well, features of somebody Rossi? who isn't. Yep, the mm-hmm. idea of a field guide for light motifs, where you could, you know, point out field marks or characteristics that could help someone notice these things in in the wild, so to speak. You know, without having every single one pointed out to them. So, it kind of features that um, as a, a motivation. How do you Another handle change, which is? Oh, oh, sorry. Go how ahead. do you handle when a theme is very strongly associated with a certain type of accompaniment? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, Almost to the um, point where it's like confusing as to whether the accompaniment could be its own separate thing. Oh my goodness! Well, actually, let me zip back here then. Okay. I I say let's include it. Um, let's include those accompanimental figures. So now, yeah, Imperial March is a huge gosh. one where that comes. It's Imperial been coming March. up a lot. Where I've been like, well, this mm-hmm. isn't technically in the catalog, but it's like I feel like it mm-hmm. honorarily should be. I know. I th- th- that's a good reason for me to really rush this out because <laughs> <laughs> it could clarify a lot of things. Um, yeah. So I've I've now made this new category. You have the Imperial March theme proper plus all these little subsidiary components, and I, I see now actually is. B through G rather than D, mm. calling them auxiliary components that can be detachable. The vamp is probably the clearest one. That's I put it in sort of mm. percussion notation, but with the chord symbols, including that that famous little sharp four that everyone forgets is actually in there. Um, and then there's these tiny micro gestures, which I don't even know if I would call them textural because they can just be one offs, like this little flourish, but they do recur. Um, Especially in Empire, like Williams makes use of every little last bit of the theme's uh, material, right? Nothing goes to waste. And I even sort of slot in the harmonic progression here, both as a chord progression and as a polychord, as really you know, characteristic components of the, the theme. So, yeah. So the, you are putting some trans- transformational, like you are putting in a little I, bit of the new harmonics. Well, like, uh, slightly. Ju- maybe just for the Imperial March. I mean, it's it's so motivic there. You know, there are other themes that have very, like, you know, Hansel and the Princess has that flat two chord um, that's very emblematic, but it's not it's not nearly as developed or essential as that progression for the Imperial March. So mm. that gets a point of pride in the catalog. Curious, has Cloud Sh- Cloud City changed? Have you? Yes, <laughs> yes, it has. You know that like um, soaring violin melody? I've just been wondering about this as I've been preparing. Oh, those is that? Well, see the that's thing is, in it, here, but that's it. Might it? It stands out, but if I think about it, it's probably not recurring very much. It just no, it's yeah. it is just in it's just its own magical little where thing. I think I think I included yeah, city in the in clouds. The there we go. That's, a, I, that's my example of a set piece theme from Empire. Yeah. And that was fun to do a chord symbol analysis of. It's it's pretty um, hard to pin down. Speaking of violin concertos, that one I think is probably oh my indebted gosh, at least partially to the Sibelius. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And it's a sign of, it's, it's affection. It's, re, it's respect for that piece. That's the thing that I, with, mm-hmm. with all these, you know, intertextual um, resonances in the Star Wars scores, it's never about Williams trying to conceal his influences i almost all i think it's always just like a a kind of loving nod to music that he knows and appreciates agreed so, yeah and i still think it's quite different from the sibelius but it, oh yeah i mean yeah. it's 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 it, you know there's a superficial initial resemblance exactly. but other than that it's, it's it's its own thing it's williams yeah, totally. right we'll get their listeners in so a, in a month or so and then there's one last um, big change. This is probably going to take the longest. Uh, we talked about this before. But yes, you're doing working it. Working in orchestration. I'm doing it. It's taking so much longer than I thought, and I'm getting all like um, distracted by subtopics. So something, if we have time, <laughs> I know we're already going very long. We haven't even gone to the Emperor stuff, but like I was inspired by preparing for this um, particular episode here by the music that in- introduces the Emperor. It's so striking and so unusual texturally um, in terms of what we are used to hearing in in Star Wars. So I thought, oh, you know, there are other instances where you hear this and they're always really highly marked. So maybe I could use this as an example, not of like 
instrumentation per se is associative, but rather like instrumental textures and mm -hmm. processes like counterpoint and registration and technique. So mm. the examples um, that I have here are, you know, they also are fairly strongly linked with certain kinds of subject matters of bad realizations or secrets. So like there's the music right before Luke finds out about his dad. Um, there's the music that Palpatine reminds Anakin in Revenge of the Sith about what happened to the sand people and his mother. It's a, mm. kind of a similar high string dissonant counterpoint. And then two really pregnant examples in The Rise of Skywalker that that once again uses high sort of uncomfortable squeamish sounding string counterpoint, mostly just two voices against one another. That I don't I don't think that it's an example of. Certainly not leitmotivic, and I'm not even sure if there's anything conscious to it. It's more like a style topic that Williams tends to recruit, mm -hmm. but it's definitely associative and it's worth mentioning. And by going with this kind of slightly more obscure um, instance, I mean, these are the, the eight that I could locate across all nine films. Um, I'm hoping that I will people who use this catalog know. will realize like there, there are other much more like pervasive textures that that are also motivic in a do sense do you have other textures that you are doing to or that you know whatever the, that will be the only one but i <laughs> then i have like oh we're gonna run through all the instruments in the orchestra and uh -huh. i see if i can get samantha to help me out with this, this the, the, the idea here may it just be like a separate document entirely a youngling's guide to the orchestra question wait can you go back up to the instrument thing oh sure the, the, okay the, so the blank instrument table here okay so are are these solo or solely both count? Okay. Oh yeah, that's a big question here. Um, uh -huh, uh -huh. Let's see. I, I, this is you're you're seeing really how the sausage gets made. This is all completely. This is fascinating. Unformatted here. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so this is just. Oh God, this is Empire Strikes Back instances of of instrumental solos and a few solely, which I don't know if I've mm -hmm. notated. Like oh, for certain instruments, listener it's solo means one piece. instrument from one one instrument playing solely means the whole section. So like. All yeah. of the flutes or, or whatever. Okay. So we, we don't tend to get string solos in Star Wars. It's like right. two examples of that, but there are plenty of soul leaf, you know, for the cello section or whatever. Mm -hmm. So I think that, I think I've noted that somewhere, maybe not, <laughs> but I'll probably try to restrain myself because there are, you know, only so many columns to fill here before it just becomes completely impenetrable. And wow. one last update here. Also having to do with orchestration. This is more just visual, but I have included headshots of all the orchestrators to put That's great. faces to names and have also cleaned up the cue list so that it now includes the length of each cue and oh. just foregrounding the orchestrator a little bit more clearly, since I really do think that they deserve credit. That's even as, as even though they're, by their own admission, glorified copyists, um, what they do is completely essential still. So wanted to yeah. reflect that somehow in this catalog. Is there a reason you're using right. the RP? Um, designated? It, I guess that's originally what must have been, rather I, yeah. than like 4M. I don't know that it was really. I think, yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm using what I see on the, the score sheets. And for the mm -hmm. first few movies, it was real seven part two. And then it became music one part three or something like that yeah at what point did it change oh the prequels okay yeah it looks like the prequels is where the, yeah. the nomenclature changed now it's going to become almost like impossibly difficult when we get to the sequels because look how many cues there are here there's so many cues it goes over the page it's it's obscene <laughs> oh my gosh um, and we don't we don't know uh the orchestrators for these i mean i think generally it's william ross um but i don't have that specific information and I really don't want to go through each one and calculate how long they are. So for the, the sequels, mm -hmm. it may just be a slightly less um, informative portion of the catalog. But yeah, this is this is the work that I do in my free time. Wow. <laughs> yeah. That plus hopefully someday finishing a book on all this material. But oh my. we'll get to that too. That's... All, in, all in due time. That's amazing. That's remarkable. Oh, has the associative progression section changed at all? Um, I don't actually think that, that that has been revised that much, although I have thought a little bit, again, inspired by what many of your guests on this <laughs> podcast have been sharing, like this really 
deep stuff about harmony and pitch construction, I thought maybe at least a, a sort of key to the various scales and maybe some of the chord types that pop up here and there, besides just the obvious major and minor. You know, right. Polychords, augmented chords, little dissonant alpha chords and octatonic mm -hmm. subsets and things like that, which, I mean, they're everywhere, right? It's it's Certainly. Flip to a random page and you'll probably find some kind of major minor tetrachord, but yeah, that, those are, yeah, maybe that will, I, I may have to just rethink the organization of this document overall too, if I'm going to include so much more. But what it, here's what it feels like. It feels like I've written the appendix for a book before the book. And in some ways, <laughs> I'm trying to it's like... It's kind of a good place it's, to it's be. It's good. Like, yeah. Like, it, it really, it, it sets up all of the sort of reference information so that I can see it. And then hopefully the, the prose writing will be much more smooth and expeditious. Mm. We'll see. Stay tuned for that, too. <laughs> I look forward to that. Um, yeah, that's... <laughs> I can't wait till you're done with that. <laughs> um, don't, don't, uh, yeah. it's at least a, a year off, probably more. So, but also now that I know what you're working on, um, well, let me know what I can keep my eye out for as well. Um, oh yeah. My oh, ear I'll, out I'll, for. <laughs> because I, I think I, I have some stuff. Definitely be. Uh, yeah. I'll be cool. listening. Um, yeah. Okay. So yeah, the, the Han and Solo, the Han Solo and the princess concert version. Um, yep. one of the three versions, we were listening to the 2018 version. Um, and the most recent one is the 2019 <laughs> version, which is <laughs> done for the solo violin and orchestra. And of course, John Williams is, I guess, violin muse. I don't know. The, the person who plays all of his solo violin stuff is um how do you pronounce her name i say you said anna is that is that what it is on sophie Mutter? i think yeah if it's, it's, it's uh, anna sophie Mutter. Okay, okay i'm not going to embarrass myself I'm... by trying a real german pronunciation but okay i've i think that's, I've how, always... he, that's how he says her name so gotcha I'll, okay. I'll defer to <laughs> the maestro in this case and you know i've been listening to her since i was a kid she's a very you know prominent <laughs> violin yeah. soloist um yeah and he loves those solo violin texts. He, he loves doing a solo violin thing. He just loves it. He does it so often. Right. It's, There's that whole album. It's, and it's surprising because it's an instrument that really does not feature in His the Star Wars scores in any pronounced way, besides the one instance in Revenge of the Sith, which is beautiful, but it's like a, a, a total exception of solo string writing. Again, there's plenty of soli string writing, but mm -hmm. solo, naked individual instruments. It's not a really, I don't know, you, you don't get away with it in, in, in genre film scoring in general. Like, I, mm -hmm. I can't remember the last time I heard just a, a fiddle, maybe Lord of the Rings. There's mostly for coloristic yeah. purposes, though. It's, it's, it's not like part of the underscore necessarily. Yeah, I was going to say the solo violin, it feels like it demands more attention that maybe there's yeah. not space for that kind of thing in, yeah, in the, yeah. one of these films. It's, a, it's interesting to think about why that's the case for violin, but not, say, horn or, or flute or oboe. Is there something special about the violin? That... Well, I think there's something special about the violin. Oh, well, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Is there something especially, I don't know, attention-grabbing about a solo string? Because I think that would also be true of a viola or a cello yeah. solo in a, in a orchestral score. Well, I think the, um, a solo string instrument, first of all, I don't think it cuts through the orchestra as m my, as much as like a solo horn mm -hmm. or oboe or flute. I don't know, just in the orchestra, I feel like strings work best as like a more blendy group instrument. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's why there's tons of them and only like three, yeah. you know, of each woodwind or, or whatever. Um, I also wonder if if it's even less common these days because of the difficulty in approximating good solo string sounds using samples. I mean, it requires a lot of work to, to get anything that sounds not embarrassing. Um, and usually it would true. just be easier to, to recruit your violinist friend to, to play, you know. But uh, that wouldn't be the case with uh, John Williams anyway. Oh, no, no. You just no, mean not for Williams. So. Mm. 
Just with other composers, yeah. Well, no, actually, in Star Wars, in Kenobi, there was solo violin that Natalie right. used James Ennis. Right, and, and is it right that she's a violinist herself? Yeah, violinist or I think violinist, it may be the case remember. that... But yeah. Yeah, but if, it, if a composer feels more comfortable with their own instrument, they'll be more likely to write solos for it. Mm, that's that's also true. But um, yeah, it, it's... That's a good question. Um, yeah. I, I don't know. But there does, there does seem to be something fundamentally different about the solo violin or solo viola or cello sound that mm-hmm. perhaps makes it less, that perhaps it would be less impactful in a scene unless there was space given to it. I don't know. I can see it happening in like a quiet scene or whatever, but it just, yeah. I don't know. Well, there's also know. maybe the, the danger of... Uh, Calling or, or, or referencing that the kind of cliche of the the sad violin, sentimental, you know, old fashioned. Um, That's true. Sap sappiness that that composers are very aware of and loath to to pursue these days. That is true. I think the solo violin sound does can sound a little bit cliche, and I feel like the solo violin. I I, I like it best when it's not like a romantic. Mm-hmm. kind of plain solo i like it best when there's like flair to it like uh, yeah know. well there are cases i mean it's generally uh a sh- a sh- if you're going to have a solo uh string instance i think it'll be a, a a showcase for your soundtrack so i'm thinking james newton howard's the village score which oh is it not jo- is it joshua bell or i don't remember who the, the solo is so is on that but it's a gorgeous score with a lot like a violin solo obligato throughout and some very lyrical stuff but mostly it's kind of textural and uh, arpeggiated and kind of minimalist James Ennis which... as well same as Kenobi oh that's oh well there yeah. you have it so yeah that 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 may be the exception that proves the rule somehow that's for <laughs> and of course and the red violin like 20 John years. Corigliano oh Corigliano. well <laughs> that's Joshua Bell. yeah <laughs> well that's that's Joshua Bell yeah that that is a Gorgeous score, yeah. but There's definitely not sound. in the same category. No. Yeah. Oh, I love that. I love that score. <laughs> Me too. Um, cool. Okay. Well, I guess let's continue listening to the minutes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Let's see. We left off at one I think C3PO. We're about to go to Vader's ship here. Yes. Okay. So 3PO comes in at With this little pizzicato interruptus. <laughs> interrupt us. Uh, yeah, okay. Thank you very much. Oh, you're perfectly welcome, sir. And that Lord Vader was the last time they appeared in any of our scopes. Considering the amount of damage we've sustained, they must have been destroyed. No, Captain. They're alive. I want every ship available to sweep the asteroid field until they are found. There's that swarming string. Yes, Admiral, Uh what is it? The Emperor commands you to make contact with him. Move the ship out of the asteroid field so that we can send a clear transmission. Yes, my lord. So that's a that's a section of the queue, which obviously is devoted to the Imperial March. Um, hearing it now, I cannot help but celebrate the use of xylophone. Mm-hmm. I don't know if that's come up already in your discussions about The Empire Strikes Back, but it seems like that's a pretty um, striking aspect of the scoring, is the, the exciting parts given to the xylophone. This is brittle and hard and rocky sonority really great for the battle brittle. of Hoth, great for the asteroid belts so yeah brittle's a good word brittle is definitely a good word for it it it, it always the the xylophone always reminds me of say song yeah bones right bones yeah it's it, that's one of those pieces that will never escape its uh, initial connotations same thing incidentally uh for the chalesta i think that that is so Wedded to the dance of the sugar plum player, mm, pl- mm-hmm. dance of the sugar plum fairies from uh, the Nutcracker, which was not the initial usage, but one of the very first. Um, and the next leg of the sequence actually features Celesta in a uh, 
a way that's not so, you know, music box, dialectic, childhood, magical. It's uh, much more ominous. Um, mm-hmm. So yeah, both both xylophone and celesta more or less locked into their connotations by 19th century musical war horses by Tchaikovsky and Sansa, but good film composers can push can buck those trends a little bit. Certainly. Um, should I keep playing? Um, yeah, let me think if there's anything more to say. I mean, that that whole leg of um, Vader's conversation is. Imperial March in C minor with some of that vamp and some of those swirling strings that you mentioned. Um, yeah, I think there's actually I, I, I one, guess inter- I'll mention, one interesting aspect of it. Yeah, I was, yeah, was going like, to go back to something any, as well. The um, the B section of the theme that that right is usually um, with sixteenth uh, notes, but in this case, actually has written out triplets, uh, which is a little bit unusual in that when the clarinets and uh, english horns are are playing it there it gives it a slightly more um slower uh, this is a s- slower sort of distended feeling even more uncomfortable than normal just a, a, a an unusual aspect but otherwise i think i mean this is just pretty straightforward i think evil, you know power music right yeah and well, I mean, one of the things that Sam and I were talking about a couple episodes ago um, was the relatively static uh, nature of the Imperial March, and the I guess I I, I want to point out the string swarm here is okay. The, the The last time I think we talked about string swarming on the show was probably during mm-hmm. um, minutes six through ten. I think it was when Luke is hanging upside down in the Wampus cave and we hear these mm-hmm. almost like Moldau esque um, yeah. sounding s- string swarming, uh, swarming strings that kind of, they swarm With a and they, synthesizer over they, it. Right. And they keep going up and mm-hmm. I don't know, they, they're, you know, they're more, it feels like they have, there's more, there's a lot of movement in that. And here it's interesting because the swarm, which is, you know, very fast, it's, you know, septuplets, 16th notes, septuplets, they stay, they're pretty stagnant. They stay, they go up and down. They just same. It like, it doesn't, it doesn't like swirl up. Right. It just continues in the same. That's kind of the, yeah. it's more of a, uh, uh, rather than the individual notes you're getting this kind of, well, swarm, like you said, this, this cluster, this pretty much. Or the harmonic minor or, or melodic minor ascending. Yeah, C harmonic minor mm-hmm. um, from the leading tone up to the flat and sixth scale degree. Yeah. So that's just. Yeah. Uh, it's, just, it's, it's, it's a texture. Yeah. yeah. Let me. Oh, yes. Well, I was going to just play the swarming. Yes, ma'am. That old data was the last time they appeared in any of our scopes. Considering the amount of damage we've sustained, they must have been. I also want to point out no, Mita's Captain, hologram voice. Alive. I want every ship available. Vader's breathing is louder than Nita's voice. Until they are found. Here's the strings. See, just up and down. That's it. Lord Vader. Yes, Admiral. What yeah. is it? The Emperor commands you. So yeah, contrast the hologram voice to Darth Maul's hologram voice in Solo, a Star Wars story which didn't sound like a hologram voice, which sounded, which was uh, mixed extremely differently than this one is, where it sounds like, you know, here it sounds like Captain Nita is on the end of like a Skype call and Darth Maul's voice at the end of Solo sounds like he is in the room with you on surround sound speakers. Um, So just a little... I guess I just I don't know a stylistic mixing choice. They had a better connection, <laughs> much better connection. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, so now we're moving on to some some emperor stuff. Out of the asteroid field, so that we can send a clear transmission. Okay. Yes, ma'am. It's after this. Little triangle.
What is thy bidding, my master? There is a great disturbance in the Force. I have felt it. We have a new enemy. The young rebel who destroyed the Death Star. I have no doubt this boy is the offspring of Anakin Skywalker. This scene gives me vertigo in my ears Search or something. your feelings, Lord Vader. You will know it to be true. He could destroy us. He's just a boy. Okay, let's talk about what is going on. Yeah, so I'll start by uh, rec recalling a, a childhood association long before I actually saw this movie. It wasn't until, I guess... 95 96 or so but there was a commercial 90s commercial for energizer which featured this scene um I'm gonna, I'll, I'll send you a link put in the show notes here of the like energizer it featured, bunny it featured the um, the this emperor. it featured this per, this very sequence here and With the original I'll always emperor. remember the original emperor and vader says what is thy bidding my master and the emperor says something like, get the battery. And that's what I always thought this scene. This, whenever I see it, no matter how many times, I expect Palpatine to, to order Vader to get the Energizer bunny rather than to try to turn Luke over to the dark side. Um, yeah, so I, in musical terms, uh, this is um, a really fascinating sequence. And you can tell because the orchestration becomes unlike anything we've really heard before in the... This, this film or in the previous, you know, and, and the new hope, the texture gets really stripped down. Um, you're hearing strings with mutes, high, high, high. Um, I think it's pretty much a low pedal. Um, is it D flat perhaps? And mm -hmm. maybe some like weirdly moving double bass, like just a, a pseudo ad lib fuzz down low plus an arp synthesizer doing the same thing down low no it's not d flat so b flat is the you know what the pedal. if you uh, allow me to yeah the pedal i have i actually mocked this up on sibelius here if you'd let me Ooh, exciting <laughs> yeah i'm gonna try this advanced technology here okay so is this visible yes it is all, all right. right if you're listening to this so we you have can also a visual see. here yeah we got visual. Um, this is not a complete rendering of the texture. It's just the strings. So I leave out the Celesta, which is doing interesting, very spooky material on its own, plus a, initially a very high woodwind cluster, um, mm -hmm. which is the sort of the, that sound plus the Celesta is how um, when Vader on that sort of uh, platform, it lights up and you get that sound effect. It's also synchronized with the uh, the woodland cluster. And then for the remainder of the scene, okay, so it's a low. This is the woodwind um, cluster. It's up here. And it's also yeah. non-vibrato. Yeah, it's it's um it's a kind of a sound effect more than a, a musical exactly. quality. Mm -hmm. And then there's this you know seven measure long passage uh for essentially just strings, muted strings, all very quiet. Um in kind of three voice counterpoint until the very end where the, the viola is split up a little bit. And as you can see, it's, it's exceedingly chromatic. There's really no key here. The, the D flat pedal plus the fuzzy glissando portamento stuff happening even lower does not stabilize this. Um, you get chords in passing, like on the downbeat of the second measure, there is a, a C minor chord, but it's not, I don't think it's really felt like C minor so much as just a, um, a momentary confluence of the notes of C minor before things move off in another direction. And yeah. I also think it doesn't, like, I, I agree that it doesn't feel really feel like C minor or it doesn't really register. And also because, I mean, you didn't write it here because I think it would be just too hard to hear, but the first violins are eight VA. They're, they're an octave higher oh, yeah. than that even. So the mm -hmm. big spread between the chord makes it, kind of hard to register yeah it's right i think i, I tried to save a little space by using no, 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 the yeah it's easier it's absolutely easier to read like that yeah. 
and there it's used very sparingly, but there are a few harmonics too towards the end. Um, in fact, I wasn't completely sure whether this is a harmonic or not, but so I put a question mark there. But these lines indicate glissandos too, um, so that as to the squeamish, unsettled nature of a lot of this music. It's also mostly octatonic. Um, I think besides this D here, everything belongs to the same sort of C, uh, uh, C, D flat octatonic scale or collection, mm -hmm. um, which is, you know, a fairly commonly utilized pitch resource for Williams. But uh, ha having that as a, uh, a pitch reference point really doesn't make this much more um, sens sensical uh, as far yeah. as like musical progression goes. It's, it's very free. Um, And there's a little bit of a octatonic descending scale fragment, but uh, I think overall the the quality is of free atonal counterpoint over a mostly inaudible bass line, um, and it's really about this striking soft, exceed, exceedingly high string polyphony that that is what's happening here, plus some you know little passing figurations for the the celestas, which is, are are also you know, atonal and chromatic in their own right. Um, I can play this. I have it Ooh, yes. just using um, the very shoddy general MIDI um, synth on my computer, but <laughs> at least give a sense of what this sounds like on its own. So you don't really get the sense of yeah. portamento or sliding there, do you? Um, yeah. But the chromaticism is probably still apparent. And then that leads to the, the dark side motif at the conclusion, which is not pictured here. Is it? Mm -hmm. The ominous little button at the very end of the cue. And I've, I've put this on the same page here on Sibelius as... Mm. Uh, I, I, I alluded to this earlier, a passage getting a bit of ahead of ourselves in terms of going through Empire Strikes Back. But I was so like, you, you listen to the score a million times and there's still things that leap out to you for the first time um, on re-listening. And it was this particular connection between the Emperor hologram scene and then Luke telling, or Vader telling Luke, you know, Obi-Wan never told you what happened to your father. And that music here uses the same texture, like these very high strings with little portamentos. It's a little bit more active, but especially towards the conclusion where you have these parallel six and loosely octatonic organization i think it very strongly resembles the um, the hologram scene so i can i can play that section too yes again using <laughs> general midi sounds And then we get right that very yeah in losing a uh, definitive oh. version. Um, yeah, maybe maybe be more reasonable to just play these yeah. clips, um, the, the actual orchestration, since it really is. I mean, you don't get it the sense properly from this uh, electronic keyboard sound. It's it's about the the string textures and their sustain and their glassy high ephemeral quality so i'll pull that up on my end here this would be in rescue no, from cloud city right oh, yeah, yeah although i'll play first the the um the cue that we're talking about just so mm -hmm. we can hear it sort of in isolation All right, so that's our cue, and then a little bit later. Thank you. 
definitely no, I'll leave it there movie. to avoid avoid spoilers there. <laughs> so um, I think particularly towards the end of that clip, I mean, I haven't gone through and done sort of like a Dominic style set class analysis. I bet there would be things to see in terms of the, the actual sonorities and and uh, collections of pitches there that that link these two passages in a more concrete way than I've done so far, because um, those are the only two cues in this score that really feature that texture. And I think that in and of itself links them in turn, uh, also their subject matter and, and um, uh, the fact that it is such a unusual sort of style for Williams, but he does make use of it elsewhere. Like it comes up occasionally in return of the Jedi and then return uh, revenge of the Sith. When um, first, when Anakin has just killed Count Dooku and Palpatine is saying, you remember what you told me about your mm -hmm. mother and the sand people? Mm -hmm. and this is a sort of uncomfortable secret that's uh, underlying their conversation. And then again, this is very brief, but w right after um, uh, Mace Window has been thrown out the window and uh, Anakin is about to be dubbed Vader, uh, I think. Palpatine is talking about like the secret to stopping death or something of that nature. And we hear similar music. Mm. And then the only other time, as far as I know, I mean, I'll have to do a, another like complete trawl through these scores to make sure this is accurate. But I think in rise of Skywalker first, when Kylo Ren is about to tell Ray that he's a pal, she's a Palpatine, we get this uncomfortable squirming high, high uh, two voice counterpoint in the strings. And then the last scene between, uh, uh, Kylo slash Ben and Han Solo, the vision of Han Solo. It's not quite the same because it's not quite as high and the tonality is a little bit different, but it's still sort of exposed dissonant string counterpoint. That's it. Is a low pedal a feature of, of this as well? Um, no. In fact, I think in uh, really the only examples of the low pedal are, are probably the Empire Strikes Back's one. Okay. The other ones so are the really high, just... Uh, I, the high string like there's no... counterpoint is the main feature. Of... Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. So oh. I found out something interesting. Um, I got in contact with Paul Hirsch, the editor for mm -hmm. Empire Strikes Back, who awesome. is very forthcoming and wanted to talk about the temp tracking for this movie. Oh. And he didn't remember, he did not remember a whole lot. Mm -hmm. The only concrete thing I could really get from him was the fact that they tempt um, the scene where Vader tells Luke that he's his dad with Bartok's music for strings, percussion, and celesta. And he wow. even gave me the specific time marker in the third movement which is this sort of night music, adagio, very creepy, famously used in The Shining, the, the adaptation of the Stephen King movie, although I think this Empire came out before that. And I think that's probably also the source, in a more distant way, um, for the, the orchestrational texture and some of the, well, the combination of high, squirmy, glissandoing strings plus Celesta in a very chromatic and um, nocturnal and uh, I don't know if threatening is quite the right word, discomforting sense. Oh, so, okay. Yeah. Awesome. So I'm going to play talk. that. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'm going to play that right now. Glissando strings in the background mm. almost make it sound like there's a synthesizer in that. It does. And I think that Williams approximates that not just with the actual string glissandos, but also what, what the, the ARP synth is doing in a few of these cues in a sort of more subtle way. It's, um, it's not a one-to-one -one similarity. There, and there are other passages in Bartok, both this piece and in the concerto for orchestra, like the the night music movement there that I think Williams also had in his ear. But it's as close as anything, I think, to a piece of classical music that 
that gets at some of the emotion and atmosphere of these these passages in Empire Strikes Back. And again, it's it's the use of strings. Um, yeah, in their high registers in this, you know, in the the it's the complete antithesis to like what we heard with the love theme at the beginning of this cue, which is all you know hyper romantic and lyrical and and uh, um, familiar and comforting. This is modernist music. You know, there's nothing to to pin down to hold on to in terms of tonality or or familiar sonority. One very different thing um, that John Williams is doing here, as opposed to this clip, is the string. The violin is much less forward, and mm. I feel like in this bar talk example, um, like I can hear clearly. I can know. I'll go clearly hear pitches vibrato it's louder it's clearly in the forefront like i can hear a melody yeah yeah so and contrast to like that your feeling lord vader you will know it to be true. you said it's muted he could destroy mm -hmm. us He's just a boy. Obi-Wan can no longer help him. The notes are moving slower, so there's less sense of a line. Right. The sun of sky it's non-vibrato. Must not become. And it's so it's so extremely high that it's like to the point of to the point of the pitches hard to discern. Like I think the highest it gets is to mm -hmm. a C, which would be like way up here. Yeah. Right. So it's, he, it's, it's definitely not like a. He no, certainly no, took that idea and make it made it very much mm -hmm. his own. And I, I think this is a case of, uh, you know, a, a temp track being actually creatively um, liberating in a way that that mm -hmm. the the director or editor has a piece in mind that you know gets at some of the sonic quality that, that i think would fit the scene but more importantly it's, it's the emotion it's the um the mood set by a, a, a lot of things here chromaticism relatively high-pitched strings presence of glissandos presence of a celesta in a uh, you know not in a uh, nostalgic music box sort of no. <laughs> uh, uh, um, childhood evocative manner but it's something much more devious and Williams uses that plus I'm sure his uh, his long-standing thorough familiarity with bar, other pieces by Bartok you know in mid early to mid-century um musical modernism a lot of the times when when Williams is writing especially the sort of dissonant but not completely like aleatoric or atonal music you'll hear the, the you know, shades of Bartok of Shostakovich of um Prokofiev Prokofiev, well, everywhere Prokofiev, mm -hmm. but I mean, particularly in Empire Strikes Back, I think there's a lot of examples of, of you know, music that that could only have come from someone who's absolutely immersed in 20th century, you know, uh, instrumental music, mm -hmm. but is not in any place copying it. Um, mm -hmm. which yeah, is, I agree with that. Which is different, different than. Uh, uh, a New Hope, where I think a lot of those references are, are more on the nose, or just as knowing, but more overt. You know, mm -hmm. like okay, here's where Holst I can draw a sort of direct line from this particular set of measures from Mars to this particular set of measures in Imperial Attack, or from Rite of Spring into, you know, like they're the temp tracking, and I think there's good reason for that too, because at that point they didn't really know what they're doing. Lucas wanted a temp track score, you know, of classical excerpts, and Williams, you know, as well known, had to sort of dissuade him from that. Here, I think it was more of a, a kind of suggestion for you know, some sort of musical milieu to capture rather than match exactly the right notes. But yeah, so this this Paul Hirsch led me down quite a rabbit hole here and led to a new appreciation of the Bartok for me and, and the interest now in tracking these kinds of high string dissonant counterpoint passages elsewhere in, in Williams's output. I'm glad you asked. That was fortuitous. Did you meet him at the conference, at the John Williams conference, or this was? Uh, no, I well, I don't know if met him is right, quite the right word. It was at a music in the moving image Zoom okay. conference. Okay. Um, 
in this nice. this past spring. So <laughs> nice. I saw his face, he saw mine, but it wasn't like you know, <laughs> right. actual interchange. But then we did correspond by email and Oh yeah, he's gosh. he's quite quite forthcoming. So I think he's he's proud of the work that he did on these movies and is excited that academics are like pouring over every last detail, musical and editorial. Hmm. Maybe I shall reach out to him yeah. at some point. Yes, I highly <laughs> recommend it. <laughs> um, okay, the <laughs> I'm going to put a link to the Darth Vader Energizer Bunny 1994 commercial yes. in the show notes because that's really, that's funny. Um, it's so good. The Energizer Bunny, by the way, comes out on top. That shouldn't be a surprise if you know his <laughs> whole shtick, but... <laughs> um, I'm going to actually play a clip from the original... 1980 movie so you can hear the original oh, voice what is thy bidding my master there is a great disturbance in the force i have felt it we have a new enemy luke skywalker yes my master he could destroy us he's just a boy obi-wan can no longer help him the Force is strong with him. The son of Skywalker must not become a Jedi. If he could His voice is more like Shakespearean. He would become a powerful mm -hmm. ally. Yes. Yes. He would be a great asset. Can it be done? Dark side mode. He will join us or die, Master. Yeah, so... Mm. <laughs> Definitely. Yeah. Um, do you like the change? The vocal quality is. Yeah. I mean, I think this is one of those instances where I'm, o I'm okay with Lucas having brought McDermott into to replace mm -hmm. almost more uh, okay with the vocal change rather than the visual, which I, I kind of like that old, like what is mm. a monkey's face superimposed with a, a woman actor's face somehow. Uh, it's a very strange uh, physiognomy initially but i mean the emperor as performed by McDermott, McDermott it has such a it has such a, a, a you know a, a wonderful vocal quality a varied vocal quality and yeah, it feels less anachronistic to, to me as well yeah you mentioned shakespeare this is kind of like yeah uh like the this it's too clean. It's too declamatory. There isn't mm -hmm. enough like sinister, mo almost monstrousness. To yeah, the exactly. There's voice, not enough like which, creepiness which oozing out of it. Yeah, I mean, definitely. <laughs> you know what we're used to, like do it. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. that, that kind of vocal quality is what I'm looking for, or unlimited power. You yeah. know, that's, uh, yeah. over the top. <laughs> that's my emperor. Melodramatic. <laughs> And, but, that, and it, but it works in this sort of marginally more understated way too. In this this scene, I mean, because I mean, he's not raging, he's not trying to like cackle <laughs> or to tempt someone. He's really delivering this at this point kind of uh, mysterious and opaque mes message. Ideally, the viewer of this movie would have no idea why they're so interested in Luke Skywalker at this point, and. So I think it's nice that it's not like, get Luke Skywalker, you know, wink, wink, nod, nod. It's a little bit more. <laughs> yeah, that's you know, true. You know, uh, uh, not quite as over the top. Still over the top, but not, not as far as it could be. Yeah, the the vocal quality or the diction, I guess, the, I don't know, the dialect, yeah. the diction. Um, I think it it makes the emperor in the original version, sound more, I don't know if refined is the right word, but I don't know, more, a little bit more like a more plain villain. Like he, definitely mm -hmm. a mastermind and all of that, but without the added level of like perversity that yeah. um, Ian McDermott's Palpatine brings. We're like, I, I you know completely. that that yeah. guy could go like way, way, <laughs> way more unhinged than you even expect. Like, mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, every every line <laughs> from the Emperor in all three trilogies, honestly, uh, yeah. is, yeah. is a, an all timer. 
um, so be it, Jedi, right? Yeah. It's infinitely quotable, and more than we tend to acknowledge comes down to exactly what you mentioned, the diction, the, the timbre, or the, the way that, as an actor, he's able to modulate his voice, mm-hmm. um, which is, you know, there, there are lots of different sort of emperor voices that we hear across these, these nine movies, and each one of them is slightly different. Um, and I think the prequels actually are responsible for showing um, he is ref- he is quite refined, you know, at the beginning of the prequels, and can oh, yeah. do that sort of, you know, he's a politician, and you know, he's a statesman, you know, yeah. And so seeing the progression <laughs> from that to his eventual emperor voice is also mm-hmm. it just adds a, a layer of like now right. you can hear the like slimy politician in him. <laughs> yeah, that's a. Uh, unexpected, but a, uh, uh, right, a surprise, surprise, a welcome was, one, whatever. A welcome one, yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah this is sort of a, a, a unctuousness to the way that he speaks, and especially in Phantom Menace. Yeah, yeah. yeah absolutely. It's ingratiating and oily. Mm-hmm. Oh, and it's actually something I think that Andy Circus did pretty well with Snoke. Is uh, you know, mm. capturing a, a similar sense of of threat and perversity in in his vocal style, while not completely mimicking. Mm-hmm. Um, or just doing an Emperor 2.0 with Snoke. Um, this is sort of a graveliness and ha- haughtiness to, to Snoke that I really like. I think it's wonderful in Last Jedi. I think that, that Snoke's performance, such that it mm-hmm. is, is, is really well done there. And we're I kind agree. of <laughs> reminded just a, a tiny shard of his voice in Rise of Skywalker, but that, that lipped out to me as being another nice, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, the the power of of the voice is a kind of controlling factor in the lives of Star Wars characters. Indeed, and I had no idea who he was when he showed up in Andor. I don't think I'd ever seen his face. Yeah. Oh, (laughs) what we're used to seeing Gollum and Caesar and King Kong and Snoke, not Andy Serkis, but he's an accomplished actor without motion capture. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay, let's continue. Walker must not become a Jedi. If he could be turned, right. he would a become Jedi. a Jedi. <laughs> yeah. Yes. He would be a great Just. asset. Can it be done? He will join us or die, Master. Do do. Which actually feel, feels like it reminds me, you know, that dark side motif. Do, do, do. It kind of reminds me a little bit of Duel of the Fates, too. Um, or like Duel uh, of the Fates the has, you know, some, you know, obviously, I don't know. Something oh, about yeah, it I see. Me. Like the, the sort of the articulation. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I think that's it. I think it's the eighth note to the. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. yeah, the eighth note to sort of a, a, a kind of briefly longer. suspended mm-hmm. chord. Yeah, no, yeah. absolutely. And that's the sound that Williams does like. Um, though they hear it's very spare, right? It's just B flat, right? I'm not even sure if the fifth is there. It's, I have to admit, it's not much of a leitmotif. Um, I included mm-hmm. it there just because it does pop up with surprisingly, uh, you know, surprisingly frequent. Um, uh, uh, regularity in the score at important moments, like the end of the sequence, magic tree, mm-hmm. and the the sort of th- through the window clash of the lightsabers moment, and then it's kind of reworked into some of the the material from the the final few cues in the movie. So I don't know about the name. I think I found that some people like the John Williams fan network were calling it dark side motif so i just decided to go with that it's, it would probably be better to have a completely neutral label like neighbor note <laughs> you know like minor <laughs> neighbor note figure but that's not enough to to warrant inclusion so uh, i gave it something a little bit more interesting sounding i think dark side is a fine is a fine name yeah um yeah yeah <laughs> <All right. laughs> so i find it all hilarious that this is all part you can listen to all of this on the Han Solo and the Princess track on <laughs> yeah. the soundtrack. This is right. all still part of that it same just, track. Just screams this, you know, romantic, doomed <laughs> love affair, you know, carbonite freeze. It's <laughs> yeah. all over the place. Um, all right. So now we're transitioning to Dagobah. 
Or it's raining and storming. Cavernous. Cavernous Dagobah. Why is it so echoey? I just don't understand why we can't see Yoda now. Patience! For the Jedi, it is time to eat as well. Eat! Eat! Hot! Soup, the thunder, good. which good. How and far away is Yoda? That's it. There's no no more music. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. But we so, mentioned a couple. Atmospheric. We were talking about the thunder, the lightning thunder a while ago, which was hmm. what he got, what Ben Burt got from Tad Staples. Which you look unfamiliar with that story. Yeah. Okay, so I will. I'm going. I'm going to repeat this because it's so funny to me. Um, Okay, Tad Staples. So the in 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 various interviews, he has revealed that a lot of the thunder on Dagobah they purchased from a man named Tad Staples, who his life was devoted to recording thunder. Oh. And yeah, Tad was blind yeah. and spent almost all of his time in a world where sound meant everything to him. He grew up in the Midwest, where there were thunderstorms in Indiana. And Ben Burt saw an interview with him on the Today Show. Um, because he was very knowledgeable about the sound of thunder, having recorded so many storms, and he got in touch with him, invited him out to California, oh. and obtained many of his thunder recordings. Oh my God! Wow! Yeah. Wow! Well, yeah, that is a. I know I would just assume that they <laughs> would have accessed some easy to <laughs> yeah. you know, easy to obtain sound library, but instead we get this. Deep story about a man's life dedicated to thunder sounds. Yeah. Every so, time we're on Dagobah. Don't take the thunder on Dagobah thunders. for granted. Wow. Well, there you have it. Cool. <laughs> yeah. So that's, these are the minutes. These are. That's the minutes. These are the minutes. Is there anything else <laughs> a lot about has them? happened here. Yeah. Is there anything else about them that we uh, didn't get to so I think about? I, uh, my notes here are pretty copious, but it seems as though I got to pretty much everything that I you know, scribbled down in anticipation for this. Um, you sent a no yeah. uh, an Andrew Norman link. What was that? Oh, that's right. That's right. So Andrew Norman is a composer that Williams mentioned uh, as a sort of um, someone, an, an up and comer that he has responded well to his music and one of Didn't he win the Norman's Pulitzer like four years ago, three, five years ago? Yeah. And I think it may have been for this piece play, um, which is a complete riot, like orchestra doing things that you never thought it was possible. Um, very exuberant and experimental and unusual and fun. And the middle movement is a little bit well, slower. And I have no idea whether Norman is influenced by Williams directly or, or indirectly, but there's this sort of section of, of chained together descending oboe scale fragments that seemed you know, it's 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 uh, almost certainly just a, a coincidence, not even a very strong resemblance, but it did sound sort of like the opening to Han Solo and the Princesses, that cue, so I thought okay, I'd send it along. Let's, it's a long let's take a listen. For comparison. <laughs> <laughs> it's fun, no matter, regardless of whether it's real. <laughs> A super slow version. Mm -hmm. Is the flute next? I don't think so. <laughs> I 
or some food? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, so I, I, I definitely hear it. It's so slow. It it's might be. Yeah, I, 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 I would be astonished if it were intentional, but it was just a fleeting thought I had, and it was mostly due to the fact that Williams... Williams drew my attention to this composer in an interview. Mm. You mentioned Norman. I know he's very famous and accomplished at this point, but um, so wow, probably says more about John me Williams. that I hear. <laughs> yeah, no, but but this comparison probably says more about me that I hear references to the score to Empire Strikes Back in everything, you know, <laughs> regardless of the composer's intent. Maybe even just like ambient sounds outside. Now, whenever I hear thunder, I'm going to have to be comparing it to like Midwestern thunder by way of Dagobah is a, <laughs> a way of understanding it. I feel like um, people who know me in a Star Wars context mm, will be judging my compositions based on like whether things are Star Wars references. Uh, <laughs> it recently happened when because uh, I was finishing up a violin solo piece and someone, it was Ender, um, like I, I preemptively said it like, oh, this part was, mm -hmm. this part of like, you know, it was like a couple beats inspired by like the rebel fanfare. And he was like, he was, he's going to ask, he said, okay, I was about to ask yep. if that was yep. an intentional, uh, <laughs> like, yeah. yeah. I mean, this is why I could it's never true. get a composition because I just <laughs> would be unable to like <laughs> detach my style from that, from John Williams. <laughs> uh goodness all right well the cues that we touched upon in this set of minutes were um well we got the very tail end of 5m3 or r5 p3 uh Yoda i mean Center. it sounds like a astromech theme or act astromech droid title right. maybe that's the reason why i preserve those <laughs> <laughs> it, it really does um and then we got solo and the princess which is 5m4 slash 6m1 why um do they why why do some of them have like double cue I think it's because the 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 numbers I mean physical real may you know, there have may split. be two different reels that that mm. have split and the cue happens to occur mm. during the you know uh, the segue Okay that makes sense Yeah When it happens in a digital like when it's not a reel what would that why would that, that I have no idea. Okay. I do not know why that would be. <laughs> okay. So it sounds like a weird artifact of a, a prior practice. Okay. Or maybe it was like two cues were spliced together because a scene changed. Maybe it was like a scene was edited. I don't know. Interesting. Okay. Um, anyway, uh, the musical themes were that we touched upon were Han and Leia A section, Han and Leia B section, the Imperial March theme, the Imperial March vamp and the dark side yes. motif um mm -hmm. and then in the soundtrack this is it was luke's nocturnal visitor and han solo and the princess which includes the emperor music um yeah, yeah. let's see i think those are the the other the only stats i had and yes this was a special edition change the emperor thing mm -hmm. not actually it, i don't think it was a special edition change i think it was Changed the DVD, the, the yeah version after the special edition. So mm -hmm. yeah, um, and I think that's okay. Anything Ben Burt? Okay, I think I'll continuing Ben Burt stuff. I think we've already covered, or we'll cover in the next episode. Um, it's it's time for you to do the Star Wars Music Minute questionnaire again. Let's see if you'll have <laughs> any. Um, <laughs> All right, uh... it's funny when Sam redid it recently for her third time. Um, she like unbeknownst to her, uh, she repeated one of her exact same answers. It was pretty funny. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. You want consistency. Yeah. Um, okay. In exactly three words, what does Star Wars sound like? Oh, what does Star Wars music sound like? I can tell you previous answers if you want. Uh, no, oh, no, no. I don't want to know that. Okay. I, 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 okay. Um, is lifelong is that one word or two that's one word all right my lifelong obsession <laughs> that's a new one right that is definitely a new one 
<laughs> uh, yeah. Previously, you said dissonant pedal tones, minor planing triads, and vaguely remembered music. Oh, yeah, You're poetic. That's good. Yeah. Yeah. You All go right. specific I'm more and poetic. And more personal <laughs> as we go. Yeah. Okay. Uh, question number two: What is something, anything related to Star Wars music or sound that you wouldn't mind knowing more about? Okay, um, I would like to, this is maybe, I don't know if we'll ever really find this out, but what actually was going on in the scoring of Obi-Wan <laughs> Kenobi, <laughs> that series. I would like to know oh more there. Oh my god, that's really funny I considering like your last answer. I still don't have the full story. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> okay. What were my last answers for this? Okay, previously you said... Um, what are we in musically? You know, what are we musically in store for as Star Wars moves on to the next chapters of its development? Okay, and yeah. then also, what was the actual score to Episode Nine supposed to be before changes? <laughs> and then also, so, your most recent answer <laughs> was, "Who will be the main composer for the Kenobi series?" <laughs> oh my! I detect a certain tr- <laughs> there's a <thread> trend there. <laughs> Who will be the main composer? And now, what is what was going <laughs> on? <laughs> what happened? Wow. That's really funny. Mm, yeah. I would like to know as well. And I've listened to almost every interview I could find to find more information on that. I'm still not quite sure. We still don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and finally, what is a score or soundtrack that you're fond of besides anything Star Wars? Now, when you say score, does it have to be a film score? No. It can be TV okay, or Okay, well then... Oh, does it have to be multimedia? Can it be a symphony? Because this is all I've been listening to recently. It does have to be multimedia. But I it also want to hear your symphony be. recommendation. Anyway. Oh, well, okay. Well, Misoslav Kabalek just got his complete symphonies. Czech composer, 20th century. His third is fantastic. Brass, organ, and percussion. Oh, okay. Very well, I'll listen gothic to and cinematic. But as far as multimedia go... All right, so I've been hearing... I haven't actually been concertedly watching this, but my wife has been watching... White Lotus, Mm -hmm. and every now and then I pop in to see a scene. It seems to have a very striking, unusual score. I don't know who who's composed it or what team, but yeah, that that's been in the air in my house lately. The score to White Lotus. Okay, I I think it's Cristobal Tapia de Beer. At least the title music. Yeah, I know it's an unusual unusual answer for me to be to have so little actual knowledge about what I'm talking about here. But really, it uh, it's just a show that my wife has been watching that seems to have unusual and it's ear-catching been recommended and to me, so different music. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Last, interesting. Hmm. No, it, you know, it's a question where you can just, you can just let loose, you know? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Previously, yeah, you said sure. Severance. <laughs> oh, yeah, I did like Severance's mm-hmm. score. Very good. And then previously you said Star course, Trek the Motion Picture. Star Trek the Motion Picture. You know, since Severance came out, my my preference for uh, uh, I don't know music to be recognized by various award shows, which you probably know I don't have much faith in. But mm-hmm. I was, I, you know, I think Severance is wonderful. But now I'm gunning for Rings of Power, which I think is just mm. the most extraordinary score. If that's how to be a lot of people have. Person. Lord of the Rings period has been one of the more mentioned scores for this, Mm. you know, for this question. And people have had mixed opinions on the Rings of Power. On the show or the the music? Or on the music and show, but you know, music as well. Uh, See, I I, I can't enforce my opinions on anyone, but (laughs) I think that the Rings of Power, the the score is a, a, a remarkable achievement. I know the film, the, the the TV show is divisive. I don't actually think that it deserves to be. I think it's it's a lot of sort of internet negativity that's spilled into the reception in hmm. non productive ways. But the score is just like an unalloyed good. It's so good. Ah, oh, does everything I want out of it. Like a a rich instrumental fantasy light motivic I, of music. I know one of the violinists who played the fiddle on that show in the, on the score. I have not seen the show because I ha- uh-huh. haven't 
delved into Lord of the Rings yet, and that's obviously a big project to do because I want mm-hmm. to. Because <laughs> I feel strongly that I don't want to watch the show first. I need to go kind of in order. Um, sure. But I have read Bear McCreary's blog post that he wrote about. Um, mm-hmm. You know the one I'm talking about. I, maybe there's been more than one, but he did sort of one He's... really big one about the process yeah. and like the whole thing. And I thought that was a really fascinating and like very honest like. I I really mm-hmm. appreciated his write up, yeah. That he did about it because it showed also how much, um, how much control, like how much he personally was writing. Like he, that was like a big point yeah. of it, like that he personally and, wrote and, every single note, mm-hmm. and he in said distinction how, exactly. He said how rare that yeah. is and how it he had to including like, for it, himself, right? Yeah. That, that that meant in a way sort of implicitly acknowledging that a lot of the other projects he's worked on yeah. have not been univocal, but this is. And, yeah. and I mean, it sounds like Bear McCreary. It really does. Um, but yeah, it, yeah, really, he's a remarkably it really highlights forthcoming how, composer. Mm-hmm. Yeah, honest, and I appreciate yeah. that. And also very theoretically articulate. Like he knows his theory, and he likes to talk about it, which is a nice thing. Nice thing for, for you. People. <laughs> yeah, writing about and, and and thinking about other people's music, like. And you can tell that he applies it too in his composition, which is not to say that you. You need to be knowledgeable. You can't write amazing and complicated film music from a purely intuitive basis. But I get the sense with him that he sort of is thinking through modulations and like particular interval combinations in a very mm. thoughtful and, and uh, deliberate way comes across in his, his scoring. Yeah. I've also heard, it's, for someone who hasn't seen the show, I've, I've randomly listened to things about it because he kind of, he did draw me in like also on an, like a video interview that he did just talking about his score, I was just thinking like how purposeful, how purposeful it seemed his sort of like holding back on certain things and his reasons Mm -hmm. for not doing certain things that fans perhaps expected and, you know, things that were going to happen in the finale supposedly. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's terrific. And I think you'll, you'll really latch onto the score when the, Time comes and you feel ready to. There's so you just have a lot of reading to, to do beforehand, reading yeah. and viewing. Yeah, yeah. But there's actually probably something to be said for just going in blind because that way you won't have to, you know, concern that's yourself true. with adaptation and changes things. That's those are, that that's the matters that, that people have gotten so incensed about. But I mean, oh, I see. Hmm. I, I'm not a purist, and I don't care that much, honestly. Hmm. I love Tolkien. Don't get me wrong, but. So, well, as a newbie, if I started from the beginning, I still, I, I at least wouldn't have like baggage from childhood to have lived with. That's good. You know, for yes. years. Yeah. <laughs> that will be freeing, I think, yeah, for sure. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> anyway, um, well, thank you so much for <laughs> coming on the show, giving us a sneak peek of the updates to your catalog. Oh my gosh. It's. It's partly it's partly accountability. Like now that I've shown it here, I have to do it. I can't just leave it good. on my my computer as a uh, an idle promise. So good. Yeah. Now people are expecting one it days. one day. Um, right. Well, in the meantime, where can people find the current version of your yeah. catalog? The current version, which actually has not been updated in a while, is okay. On when you Frank say Lehman. in a while, com. you mean like five months. Yeah, that's right. No. It's still so, well, it's, it's, I would be probably updating it more frequently, but I have this massive update now, and to send it out in its current state, you saw it has all these, you know, pages full. Right. Of notes it's like, to do you keep and, doing iOS fifteen point five, fifteen point five point one, but you're working on like sixteen? You're working on a whole. Oh, new... this is going to be yeah. This is going to be a whole new operating system. Yeah. Revised, expanded, catalog two point oh. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so franklyman.com yeah. oh, yeah. slash so that, Star Wars. <laughs> franklyman.com, yeah. And uh, sorry to say, but I am no longer on Twitter, so this is true. I, I cut, cut loose from there. But you can still find me on social media on Facebook. You know, good old Facebook, uh, Franklyman. And I'm happy to befriend anyone that way. And I do post mostly, uh, you know, pictures of birds and <laughs> music, musical <laughs> recommendations or discoveries there. So not that different from my former... Twitter presence. Yeah. Yeah. Because of you, whenever I, you know, have been seeing birds in my recent trips to Australia, I'm just like, I wonder if Frank knows this oh. bird. Yeah. Oh my God. That's I a always, dream someday to go to Australia. The, the avifauna there is just to die for. What did you call it? 
AV fauna? The a- AV fauna. Oh, yeah. All right. <laughs> okay. All right. B- uh, New- bird life. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> New term for me. Um, and also, uh, I think a lot of listeners would like to know about your Indiana Jones catalog as well. Oh, yes. So there is a new Indiana, Indiana Jones film in the works. It should be coming out, I think, July of this year. Um, and I'll probably update that with some long promise sections on, you know, just more themes, not necessarily light motifs, but little action sequences and creepy crawler bug and snake music and things like that. Plus, of course, whatever, when we find out the new themes for Indiana Jones 5, those will be plugged in there as soon as humanly possible. You have your so, work yes. cut and out that's, for you. that's franklyman.com slash, I think, just Indiana, Indiana Jones. Mm-hmm. If you just go to franklyman.com, you can see all the yeah. all the catalogs there. Um, yeah, that's that's awesome. And also, listeners, you might be interested in Frank Lehman's book, Hollywood Harmony, Musical Wonder and the Sound of Cinema, which is available on Amazon. It's very oh, good. Oh, yeah. 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 It's it very out. good. I learned... I, <laughs> learning a lot from it and um well you don't you have a another book in the works but that won't be out for a while yeah but it's it's my main project that's great um we're gonna do it you will do it and i will excitedly read it uh listeners you can find the show you know wherever social media is wherever you get podcasts as you know i'm not the best at social media um and, you know, not the best at keeping up, but you can find me usually at Chris Anthony Tan on the various platforms as well. I am still on Twitter. I'm also on, you know, Mastodon and Hive, but not really very active. It's, you know, yeah. it, the bandwidth for keeping, for having too many of them is just ridiculous. Too much. <laughs> it's it really way too is. high and there's, I have too much work to do. Um, <laughs> but still, like you can always, um, you can always email me as well at podcast at starwarsmusicminute.com and um if you become a patron you can join my discord server and that's usually where i source questions the most often since you know it's it's a place to check in without ads and without you know stuff like that um yeah we are almost almost halfway done if not halfway done we're almost halfway done with this film and wow it's gone by so fast Uh, Yeah, we'll be back next week to talk about minutes 56 through 60, in which um, we're going to find out who Yoda is. So, spoiler. I know. It's going to be... It's such a great cue. Oh, It's really good. I know. Yeah. Very good. You can't Um, go... You can't go wrong in this movie. You really can't. You can't. Even the boring... Even the boring cues, like comparatively boring. There's no dull moments. It's true. Yeah. Yeah. Every week... the guest is like, oh, this is like the best part. And I'm like, I know, all of the parts are the best part. Um, yeah. So, uh, yeah, that's a little incentive to, to come back next week. Um, yeah. So uh, may the force be with you. And thanks for listening to Star Wars Music Minute.